almost four decades of mass evangelism in nearly 70 countries, we've prayed for hundreds of thousands of people who have attended our crusades, seeking forgiveness for their sins, relief for their burdens, solutions for their problems, and healing for their diseases. We've seen every kind of miracle imaginable, including the raising of the dead and the cleansing of lepers. For years, we've seen the need for a practical book which would set forth the essential Bible truths about healing. Often, people in need of God's help lack a clear grasp of the Bible facts which create the faith for God's miracles, for His solutions, and for His healings. In the seven sections of this audio book, we present to you seven steps to receive from Christ the miracle that you need. These are the basic truths which we've taught to millions face to face in our great crusades around the world. They are the steps which have brought faith and miracles to hundreds of thousands of people. Those who pray but fail to receive the miracle from Christ that they desire usually lack knowledge of what the Bible says about God's blessings. Without knowing these truths, the person in need has no basis for faith. Hundreds of people have told us that after having been prayed for without results, they later received a miracle from God through their own faith when they read the book that we're recording for you and learned what the Bible so clearly teaches about prayer and faith. A totally deaf man wept while I prayed for his healing. However, when his ears didn't open immediately, he left the platform very disappointed. I gave him a copy of our book, Miracle Healing. He promised to read it. He returned two days later rejoicing with perfect hearing. He said that as he was reading the book, he received Christ and a new living faith and was instantly healed of his deafness. Jesus said in John 8, 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And Paul said in Romans 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing the word of God. So we've prepared this book, and now we're recording this audio edition for those who desire and need God's miraculous blessings and who want to glorify God in their lives. Expect the miracle you need from God while you're listening to this recording. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the truth. He will reveal himself and manifest his power and presence to you individually as he comes to you through this recording. He'll come to you while we're speaking to you. So listen reverently. Expect the presence of the living Christ. He promised you that as you love him and seek him, I will love you and will manifest or reveal myself to you, and I will come to you and make my abode with you. In John chapter 14, verses 21 to 23. Message number one, the miracle Christ. Here is one of the most wonderful statements in the Bible. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. That's in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. This is the Jesus who walked the shores of Galilee, who healed the sick, cleansed the lepers, and raised the dead. This is the Jesus who forgives sinners and relieves the oppressed. He's the Son of God who came into this world, according to 1 Timothy 1, 15, to save sinners. This Jesus is the same today as he was in Bible days. His power is the same as it was then. His ministry is no different now than it was then. When you read the Gospels of the Lord Jesus Christ, remember this. God wants you to believe that whatever Christ did for people then, He will do for you today. Christ, who walked the shores of Galilee, is right there at your side this very moment. He's there to heal you if you're sick. He's there to save you if you're a sinner. He's there to relieve you if you're oppressed. He's there to help you if you're in need. Jesus, who healed the sick and gave sight to the blind, still has compassion for those who suffer today. He who blessed the poor and forgave sinners then is still the Savior now. People then, people today. If people could come to him and receive his mercy in Bible days, you or I can come to him and receive his mercy today. If God's promises were good in Bible days, his promises are just as good today. 
If the leper could fall down before him and receive healing then, a leper can fall down before him and be miraculously cleansed today. If paralytics could rise and be made whole at his command then, paralytics can be instantly healed through the power of his word today. If unbelievers could be saved, forgiven of their sins, and reborn to a new life then, they can be changed by his power today. How glad I am to know that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has not changed. We've seen him do miracles and wonders. We've been present when he raised paralytics up and they walked and ran and jumped. We've witnessed the marvelous miracle of the opening of blind eyes so very many times. We've beheld the wonder of him unstopping deaf ears and loosing dumb tongues. Jesus said, All power in heaven and in earth is given unto me. And his word says, If we shall ask anything in his name, he will do it. The Bible says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. Jesus Christ really is the same yesterday and today and forever. We've seen the Lord do these miracles with our own eyes hundreds, even thousands of times during nearly four decades of gospel crusades in nearly 70 nations. Therefore, no one can tell me that Jesus Christ is dead or that he has changed. People change. Traditions and religions change. Nations and governments change. Churches and ecclesiastical systems change. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. The Healing Christ. The Bible says he went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. The Bible says in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Isn't that terrific? Thank God he's still doing those same miracles of mercy and compassion today. The Bible gives an account of one of the meetings where Jesus was preaching and ministering. It's in the 11th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. It says the blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. If he did those things then, he'll do those things today. What did the people do when Jesus was visibly among them? If we want Christ to do what he did for the people in Bible days, then we must do what the people did. We must come to him like they came to him, hear his word like they heard, believe on him like they believed on him, call on him like they called on him, follow him like the people followed him then. The Bible says that the people ran through the whole region round about and began to carry about in beds those that were sick where they heard he was. And they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch, if it were, but the border of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole. That's in Mark chapter 6, verses 55 and 56. My friend, that can happen today the same as it happened then. As many as touch him today will be made whole, just the same as they touched him then and were made whole. Death could not stop him. During three years... Jesus walked among people here on earth. He was always healing, blessing, and forgiving humanity. Multitudes flocked after him, and he always blessed them. But in spite of his mercy, his love, and his miracles of compassion, he was despised by religious people, rejected, and finally crucified. But after they put him in the sepulcher, three days later, God raised Jesus from the dead, according to the Scriptures. After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples as they were together, and he commanded them with these words in Mark 16, verse 15, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then he promised, You that believe and are baptized will be saved. And then he warned, You that believe not will be damned. And then in Mark chapter 16, he made this wonderful promise. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name you shall cast out devils. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And then he promised, lo, I am with you always. 
even unto the end of the world. That's in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. A terrific promise. What a terrific promise. That means that the Lord is with me as I speak to you right now, and he's with you as you listen right there where you are at this moment. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The Bible says in Mark chapter 16, verses 19 and 20, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven, sat on the right hand of God, and then his followers went forth and preached everywhere, listen to this, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. That same Lord Jesus Christ is right there with you now to confirm his gospel to you, just the same as he was with his disciples after his resurrection, confirming the word with signs following. He said in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, if you can only believe, all things are possible to those that believe. He's there with you right now in his spirit to confirm his promise to you if you can only believe, and you can. Whatever he promised in his word, if you'll earnestly ask him to do it, and believe in your heart that he's heard and answered your prayer. He'll confirm his promise by his power, and you'll receive the answer to your prayer. Christ has not changed. A blind man came to one of our meetings, and when he walked on the ground where we were proclaiming the gospel, he suddenly had a vision. He saw a light brighter than the sun, and in that light the Lord Jesus appeared to him. The blind man fell to the ground, and the people thought he'd died. But after a while, he opened his eyes, and he was weeping as he told them how the Lord had appeared to him. His blindness was gone. He had recovered his sight. The same Jesus who appeared to that man is right there with you at this moment to confirm his promises to you if you'll only believe. We were preaching the gospel in India. A man full of unbelief came to the meeting. He listened, but he didn't believe. After the message, we prayed for the great multitude of people there, and suddenly this man saw Jesus standing right before him. The Lord stretched out his hands toward him and said, Behold my hands, I am Jesus. This unbelieving man saw the nail-pierced hands of the Lord Jesus and fell down before him, crying out for mercy. He received Jesus Christ into his heart right there on the spot, and he accepted him as his personal Savior. We've witnessed miracles like this around the world, and the Lord is ready to do a miracle for you right there where you are if you'll only believe. Whatever you need from the Lord, if you'll ask him to do it and believe that he hears and answers your prayer, he'll do it for you. Jesus Christ is alive. He's never changed. He's there with you to confirm his word and to bless you. You may not see him, but he's there just the same. He said, if you can only believe, all things are possible, and you can believe. I ask you right now to draw near to the Lord in your heart, and as you listen, let's call on the name of the Lord in prayer and welcome his presence, so that as you continue to listen to this audio recording of this book, He'll be right there to reveal his truth to you and to manifest his power by a miracle in your life. That's what he wants to do for you. Jesus said, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. What do you want Jesus Christ to do for you right now? Reverence his name and believe on him with all of your heart. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Bible says, and you shall be saved prayer by Mr. Osborne for you. I want to pray for you right now before we continue the rest of this audio edition of this book. Oh, Father in heaven, I pray for the person who is listening right now to this audio edition of this book, Miracle Healing. I ask that Jesus Christ, your son, will come to this person who's joined with me in prayer right now. Each time they listen to any section of this audiobook, let your loving presence be manifested in some marvelous way. As chapter after chapter is read to them, reveal your person and your power through this recording. May each message in this book bring a new, fresh revelation to them of you. 
if this person has not been born again, reveal the marvelous truth of salvation through this audio recording right now. Forgive every sin while this person is listening. And Lord, if this one is sick, let the truths of your healing become radiant and clear. Let Jesus Christ manifest himself as the ever-present healer with whom nothing is impossible. As each message is read and shared and recorded for them, let the dynamic truth of this gospel unfold to them. Let your healing power be received. Whatever sickness or disease or infirmity is oppressing the person that's listening right now, Lord, show your healing power through this truth. As they understand these wonderful truths, let the miracle power of Jesus Christ penetrate their body, even now while they listen. Cause every symptom of disease to disappear. I know you're beginning to do it right now because you've said in your word, you sent your word and it healed the people. You said you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Thank you, Lord, for your miracle presence and your healing and saving power right now. As each message of this audio book is shared with this person. Let it be a continuous journey of miracles that confirms each truth that we present. Let it be known that you are the same yesterday and today and forever. I ask this blessing upon this person listening right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Message number two. Why miracles? When Jesus began his public ministry, it was a ministry of miracles. His conception, his birth, his life, his wisdom and teachings, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, his appearances, and his ascension were all astounding and undeniable miracles. When the church began her ministry, it was a ministry of miracles. A stream of miracles flowed from the hands of the apostles, upsetting religious systems of that day to the extent that even the Roman government trembled. Those first Christians had made a discovery that the Christ, whom God has raised from the dead, had the same power and worked the same miracles in response to their command and their prayers when given in his name as he had done before they had condemned him and killed him that he was alive again, that he lived in them, that he had not changed. The sick were healed, the dead were raised, demons were cast out. Christianity, the miracle life. Those first years of the early church history, recorded in the Acts of the Apostles, were example years for the Acts of the church, for the Acts of all believers, until the return of Jesus Christ. This is authentic Christianity. If we do not have the supernatural in Christianity, we have nothing but another religion. And true Christianity is not a religion, it's a life. Religion's a form, a ceremonial observance. But Christianity is a life. Christianity is the heart and nature of Jesus Christ being manifested in human beings. Christianity is the miracle life. It began in miracles. It's based on a succession of miracles. It's propagated by miracles. It's the only life which will satisfy the heart hunger of humanity worldwide. The Bible's a miracle book, a record of divine happenings. Beginning with Abraham, many of the major characters of the Old Testament history were miracle workers, or rather, God wrought miracles in response to their daring and active faith. The purpose of these miracles was to prove to the people the difference between the dead gods of the heathen and the true and living God who is the creator of heaven and earth and to convert unbelievers to worship the living God. When miracles ended, the people lapsed into the worship of dead gods and they only returned to the living God after another series of astounding miracles. People want the living God. They crave a miracle. Whenever there rises a person whose prayers are heard and answered, greater crowds will flock to hear them than to hear the most famous philosopher or statesman in the world. 
made for miracles. This love of the miraculous is not a mark of ignorance, but rather reveals humanity's intense desire to know the unseen God. In fact, God's purpose and plan for humanity from the beginning was for people to have supernatural ability and authority. Human beings were created with these aspirations. Adam and Eve were created and placed in the Garden of Eden. Made in God's own image, they were destined to live and plan and work with God, carrying out His divine plan on earth. Created in God's image, man and woman are God's kind of being. They can never find full satisfaction without Him. Human beings instinctively seek God, whether or not they admit it or are even conscious of it. Human life has divine purpose, and until that divine purpose is discovered, there's a vacuum, an emptiness. Being the offspring of the miraculous God, people have an inborn hunger to experience miracles. Education does not eliminate the desire for the miraculous. Some assert that education has taken the place of miracles, that we no longer need the supernatural proof of God. One mighty miracle today in the name of Jesus Christ is worth more than a lifetime of theological theory. People want to see God in action if He's alive and real. Every real spiritual awakening that has honored Christ in His Word has been accompanied by miracles of physical healing. It's impossible to properly honor God's Word and not witness miracles. All human beings crave the supernatural. They long to see a manifestation of the power of God. Even an atheistic professor who denies any existence of God will edge into the crowd to watch a miracle if he thinks it might happen. Cultured people will listen to an uneducated preacher if there's evidence of faith in the living God and if that preacher prays and gets an answer. A dead religion has no resurrection power in it, no miracle working force behind it. This yearning for the miraculous is deep-seated in each human being regardless of nationality or background because we are the offspring of the miracle God. Men and women need the miracle touch of Jesus Christ now as much as ever. Christ is as much a miracle worker today as he ever was. The Bible says that he's the same yesterday and today and forever. Christ must be allowed to live in us, in his power and in his life. That alone is true Christianity. All else is ecclesiastical routine, offering little more than rituals and symbolic ceremonies. Our slogan is, Jesus is the living, miracle-working Christ. Jesus attracted the multitudes by miracles, and wherever miracles are wrought in his name today, he continues to attract the multitudes. Foundation for Miracles When anyone exercises Bible faith, there follows Bible results. Why the lack of miracles in many circles today? The Bible says faith comes by hearing the word of God. But too often, faith leaves by hearing the word of theologians. Unbelief instead of faith is produced when religious leaders make the word of God of none effect through their tradition, like they did in Mark chapter 7, verse 13. You may call for a week of fasting, but this will not bring the miraculous into evidence if you do not teach the promises of God in their absolute simplicity. You may consecrate entire nights to prayer, but it'll be of no avail if your teaching doesn't encourage simple faith in Christ. A real spiritual awakening begins in the teacher, in the pastor, in the priest, the missionary. The message must be right or all else is vain. Both laymen and the clergy must be willing to adjust their thinking or teaching or action which does not accept God's word as literally valid today. Otherwise, a spiritual awakening will not take place. Faith comes by hearing the word of God, according to Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith does not come by hearing the teaching of the traditions of religion. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 6, 
you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. And then in Mark chapter 7, verse 9, you reject the commandment of God so that you may keep your own tradition. We cannot rely on the complexities of modern theology and get Bible results. We cannot use the methods of an obsolete ecclesiasticism and win unbelievers to Christ. If we want to reap the fruit of faith, we must sow the seed of faith, which is the word of God. The sick will be healed, sinners will be converted, and unbelievers will turn to Christ in any locality when the gospel is proclaimed and when actions correspond with the teaching, causing Christ in his power to confirm his word. You cannot shut out the miraculous when truth is proclaimed. The Bible says in John chapter 8, verse 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, I am truth. God sent his word and healed the people, according to Psalms 107, verse 20. Robert Young's translation of that verse is, he sends his word and heals them. Present tense. God is doing that all the time. God is doing that now while I'm speaking to you. According to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 22, God's promises are life to those that find them or hear them and health to all their flesh. Ministry of Miracles Among the tens of thousands who have been miraculously healed by Christ during our own crusades in nearly 70 nations, during almost four decades of ministry, almost none of them have been individually prayed for. They've been healed through their own faith, which was born in their own hearts while meditating on the Bible truths that we're presenting to you right now on this recording, the same truths that we presented from our crusade platforms all around the world. I've discovered that almost any church member in any nation has been convinced that sickness may be God's blessing in disguise that it may teach them humility and patience, that it may have divine purpose, and that, therefore, it should not be resisted, but graciously accepted and humbly borne with patience for God's glory. Isn't that strange? But I've also discovered that very few people in the world who believe all these other things can quote a single scripture in the Bible that promises physical healing. If these promises are not taught, the people cannot know them. If the people do not know these truths, there can be no faith for miracles. If there's no faith for miracles, then they won't be experienced. The Urgency of Miracles If miracles are not experienced, there's little to draw the unbeliever to hear the gospel and less to persuade the unbeliever to believe the gospel. But the solution is positive and wonderfully accessible. Jesus, by his example, proclaimed and performed miracles. His disciples followed that pattern to establish a vital, living church. Today, the need for miracles as evidence of Christ's living presence is at least as great as it was then. Knowing in advance that we would face obstacles, apostasy, and unbelief, Jesus promised in John chapter 14, verse 12, Believe on me, and the works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do, because I go to my Father. The key to miracles is simple faith that Christ meant what he said. Believe that God is what he says he is. That you are what his word says you are that God will do what his word says he will do, that you can do what his word says you can do, that God has what he says he has, and that you have what his word says you have. Read the words of Jesus in the New Testament and apply these facts. Discover who you are and what you have. See what God will do in your life. Whenever and wherever people accept the promises of God and the teachings of Jesus Christ on the basis of the above facts, great spiritual awakenings accompanied by signs and wonders and miracles are bound to take place sooner or later. Miracles in this century are as valuable and indispensable to authentic Christianity as they ever were in any century. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 says, I am the Lord 
I change not. Matthew 24, verse 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. We've put God's promise to the test in nation after nation. He's proven to be the same in this century as he was in Bible days. Jesus, the miracle worker. The world was shocked by the immense crowds and the astonishing miracles that took place in our Holland Crusade. Over a hundred thousand people gathered day after day on the great Malieveld grounds in The Hague, the capital, to listen to the gospel as we presented it to that field of people. Our theme was basic. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. That verse from the Bible has been the theme of every crusade we've conducted throughout decades of miracle ministry in nearly 70 nations. I believe that people need to know that Jesus is as real today as he was before he was crucified. He promised in the last chapter of Matthew, lo, I am with you always. He's here to do the same miracles today for you that he did in Bible days. His promises have never changed. His power and ministry are unchanged. He is as merciful and compassionate as he ever was. He loves you right there where you're listening right now. And I believe a new miracle is beginning in you right now as new fresh faith is being born. My wife Daisy and I are very fortunate people. We accepted Jesus as our Savior when we were very young. We dedicated our lives to share the good news of the gospel with others, and we've witnessed powerful miracles all over the world through active faith in God's promises. I had a vision of Jesus. He appeared in my room. I saw him with my own eyes that Jesus Christ, God's Son, is alive. From that day, we dedicated ourselves to obey him and to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I knew that he had promised, These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And lo, I am with you, even to the end of the world. Miracles Around the World In every nation where we've journeyed, great crowds have assembled. Thousands have repented of their sins and have found new faith to follow Jesus. All kinds of miracles have been done by God as we've prayed in Jesus' name. The Bible says the disciples went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. This has been our testimony for decades. God is real. The Bible is God's word. Every word is true, and you can trust it. God wants us to put his word to the test for miracles today because this generation needs miracle proof that Jesus Christ is as real as he was in any other generation. So act on his promises in the Bible and claim his miracle for you and your house today. His word cannot fail. Now Dr. Osborne is ready to share with you part one of this audio book, Receive Miracle Healing. The two vital messages in this first part deal with the subject, The Healer. The author says, the first step to receive miracle healing is to know that the age of miracles has not passed and that physical healing is part of Christ's ministry today. Now here's Dr. T.L. Osborne with his message number three, Healing for Today. In Bible days, the sick were healed, the blind received their sight, the deaf were made to hear, cripples walked, lepers were cleansed, and all manner of sick and suffering people were made whole by God's power. These miracles are as much for today as they ever were. There are five basic reasons why we can know this. Let me give them to you in brief, then repeat them. Number one, God is a healer. Number two, Jesus Christ healed the sick. Number three, he commanded his disciples to heal the sick. Number four, the early church ministered to the sick. Number five, Jesus commissioned all believers to heal the sick. Now let's go over those again. Number one, God is a healer, Exodus 15, 26. And he's never changed. He said in Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord, I change not. Number two, Jesus Christ healed healed the sick, and he's never changed. Hebrews 13 and 8 says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Number three, 
Jesus commanded his disciples to heal the sick, and a true disciple of Christ is the same today as then. John 8, verse 31, he said, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Number four, miracles of healing were manifested in the ministry of the early church, and the true church has never changed. The work and ministry of the early apostles is the example and pattern for the true church to the end of the world. And number five, Jesus commissioned all believers among all nations to the end of the world to lay their hands on the sick, promising that they shall recover, Mark chapter 16. And certainly, true believers have never changed because Jesus said, if you believe on me the works that I do shall you do also that's in John chapter 14 verse 12 miracle healing was administered first through the spoken word of Jehovah God then through the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ next through the disciples who acted on his word and followed his example Later, by the power of the resurrected Christ and of the Holy Spirit being manifested through the early church. And finally, by the same risen Christ and the power of the same Holy Spirit functioning through the lives of all believers in all the world. Therefore, the age of miracles has not passed, and physical healing is as much a part of Christ's ministry today as it ever was. And what he has done for so many tens of thousands of others, it is his will to do for you. Message number four, 100 Facts About Healing. Many believe that God sometimes heals the sick, but they have no personal knowledge of Jesus as the indwelling, ever-present healer. They know nothing about the many facts which prove that physical health is part of everyone's salvation. They see others healed, but they question whether healing is God's will for them. They are waiting for a special revelation of the will of God concerning their case. In the meantime, they're doing all within the power of human skill to get well with the use of natural means, whether it's God's will for them to be healed or not. If it is not God's will for you to be well, it would be wrong for you to seek recovery even through natural means. If it is God's will for you to be well, then it's only logical that the best way of recovery is by divine means. The Bible reveals the will of God in regard to the healing of the body as clearly as it reveals the will of God in regard to regeneration of the spirit. God need not give any special revelation of his will when he has plainly given his revealed will in his word, that is, when he has definitely promised to do a thing. God's promises to heal are as much a revelation of his will to heal as his promises to save reveal his will to save. A careful study of the scriptures by an unprejudiced person will clearly show that God is both the Savior and the healer of his people, that it is always his will to save and to heal all those who are willing to serve him. In evidence of this, we call your attention to the following 100 facts. Fact number one. Sickness is no more natural than sin. God made all things very good, according to Genesis 1.31. Therefore, we should not look for the remedy of sin nor sickness in the natural, but from God who created us happy, strong, healthy, and in fellowship with him. Fact number two. Both sin and sickness came into the world through the fall. Therefore, we must look for the healing of both in the Savior. Fact number three. When God called his children out of Egypt, he made a covenant of healing with them. Exodus 15, 26. Throughout their history, we find them in sickness and in pestilence, turning to God in repentance and confession, and always, when their sins were forgiven, their sicknesses were healed. Fact number four. In Numbers 21, 8, God healed those who had been bitten by fiery serpents as they looked at a brazen serpent on a pole, a type of Calvary. See John 3, verse 14 and 15. If everyone who looked at the brazen serpent was healed then, it's logical that everyone who looks at Jesus can be healed today. Fact number five. 
Jesus said in John 3, 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, or for the same purpose, must the Son of Man be lifted up. Also see Numbers 21, verses 4 to 9. Fact number 6. The people had sinned against God then. Humanity has sinned against God today. Fact number 7. The poison serpent bite resulted in death then. The wages of sin is death today, Romans 6.23. Fact number 8. The people cried to God then, and he heard their cry and provided a remedy. The serpent lifted up. Those who cry to God today discover that God has heard their cry and has provided them a remedy. Christ lifted up. Fact number 9. The remedy was for everyone that is bitten then. The remedy is for whosoever believeth today. See John 3.16. Fact number 10. In their remedy, they received both forgiveness for their sins and healing for their bodies. In Christ, we receive both forgiveness for our sins and healing for our sick bodies today. Fact number 11. There were no exceptions then. Their remedy was for everyone that is bitten. There are no exceptions today. Our remedy is for whosoever believeth. Fact number 12. Everyone was commanded to individually look at the remedy then. Everyone is commanded to individually believe on Christ today. Fact number 13. They did not need to beg nor make an offering to God then. There was only one condition, when he looketh. We do not need to beg nor make an offering to Christ today. There is only one condition, whosoever believeth. Fact number 14. They were not told to look to Moses, but rather to the remedy then. We are not told to look to the preacher, but to Christ today. Fact number 15. They were not to look to the symptoms of their snake bites then, but rather to their remedy. We are not to look to the symptoms of our sins and diseases today, but to the remedy, Christ. Fact number 16. Everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live, was the promise to all then, without exception. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, is the promise to all today, without exception. Fact number 17. Since their curse was removed by lifting up of the type of Christ, our curse was certainly removed by lifting up Christ himself. See Galatians 3.13. Fact number 18. The type of Christ could not mean more to those Israelites then than Christ means to us today. Surely they, through only a type of Christ, could not receive blessings which we cannot receive today through Christ himself. Fact number 19. In Psalm 91, God promises protection for our bodies as well as for our spirits if we abide in Him. In the New Testament, John wishes above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. 3 John verse 2. Both scriptures show that God's will is that we be as healthy in our bodies as we are in our spirits. It's never God's will for our spirits to be sick. It's never God's will for our bodies to be sick. Fact number 20. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, Asa died in his sickness because he sought not to the Lord but to the physicians. While in Isaiah chapter 38, Hezekiah lived because he sought not to the physicians but to the Lord. Fact number 21. In Isaiah chapter 53, the removal of our diseases is included in Christ's redemptive work along with the removal of our sins. The word bear implies substitution, suffering for, not sympathy, suffering with. If Christ has borne our sicknesses, why should we bear them? Fact number 22. In Matthew 8, verses 16 and 17, Christ fulfilled Isaiah's words, He healed all that were sick. Fact number 23. In Job 2 and 7, sickness is revealed as coming directly from Satan. So went Satan forth and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown.
Job maintained steadfast faith as he cried out to God for deliverance, and he was healed. See Job 42, verses 10 to 12. Fact number 24. In Luke chapter 13, verse 16, Christ declared that the infirm woman was bound by Satan and ought to be loosed. He cast out the spirit of infirmity, and she was healed. Fact number 25. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 22, a devil which possessed a man was the cause of his being both blind and dumb. When the devil was cast out, he could both see and talk. Fact number 26. In Mark chapter 9, verses 17 through 27, a demon was the cause of a boy being deaf and dumb and also the cause of his convulsions. When the demon was cast out, the boy was healed. Fact number 27. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it's written, Jesus of Nazareth went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. This scripture shows that sickness is Satan's oppression. Fact number 28. In 1 John 3 and 8, we are told, The Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Sickness is part of Satan's works. Christ, in his earthly ministry, always treated sin, diseases, and devils the same. They were all hateful in his sight. He rebuked them all. He was manifested to destroy them all. Fact number 29. He does not want the works of the devil to continue in our physical bodies. He was manifested to destroy them. He does not want a cancer, a plague, a curse, the works of the devil, to exist in his own members. 1 Corinthians 6.15 says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Fact number 30. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 56, The Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Sickness destroys. Therefore, it's not from God. Christ came to save us. That word save is translated from the Greek word sozo, meaning to deliver us, to save and preserve us, to heal us, to give us life, to make us whole, but never to destroy us. Fact number 31. Jesus said in John 10 and 10, The thief, speaking of Satan, cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But he said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Satan is a killer. His diseases are the destroyers of life. His sicknesses are the thieves of happiness, health, money, time, and effort. Christ came to give us abundant life in our spirits and in our bodies. Fact number 33. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, we are promised the life of Jesus in our mortal flesh. Fact number 34. In Romans 8 and 11, we are taught that the Spirit's work is to quicken our mortal bodies in this life. Fact number 35. Satan's work is to kill. Christ's work is to give life. Fact number 36. Satan is bad. God is good. Bad things come from Satan. Good things come from God. Fact number 37. Sickness is therefore from Satan. Health is therefore from God. Fact number 38. In Matthew 10 and 1, in Mark 16 and 17, and in Luke 10, 19, all authority and power over all devils and diseases was given to every disciple of Christ. Since Jesus said in John 8, 31, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, these scriptures apply to you today. That is, if you continue in or act in his word. Fact number 39. In John 14, verses 13 and 14, the right to pray and receive the answer is given to every believer. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. This logically includes asking for healing if you are sick. Fact number 40. In Matthew 7, verses 7 to 11, the promise is, Every one that asketh receiveth. That promise is for you. It includes everyone who is sick. Fact number 41. 
In Luke chapter 10, verse 1, verse 9, and verse 19, the ministry of healing was given to the 70 who represent the future workers of the church. Fact number 42. In Mark 16 and 17, the ministry of healing was given to all them that believe the gospel, that is, them that act on the gospel, or the practicers, or doers of the word. Fact number 43. In James 5.14, the ministry of healing is committed to the elders of the church. Fact number 44. In 1 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10, the ministry of healing is bestowed upon the whole church as one of its ministries and gifts until Jesus comes. Fact number 45. Jesus never commissioned anyone to preach the gospel without including healing for the sick. He said in Luke 10, verse 8 and 9, Into whatsoever city ye enter, heal the sick that are therein. That command still applies to the ministry today. Fact number 46. Jesus said that he would continue his same works through believers while he's with the Father. In John 14, 12, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. This certainly includes healing the sick. Fact number 47. In connection with the Lord's Supper, the cup is taken in remembrance of his blood, which was shed for the remission of our sins, 1 Corinthians 11:25. The bread is eaten in remembrance of his body on which were laid our diseases and the stripes by which we are healed. 1 Corinthians 11, 23, 24 and Isaiah 53, 5. Fact number 48. Jesus said in Mark 7, 13 that certain teachers were making the word of God of none effect through their tradition. Human ideas and theories have for centuries hindered the healing part of the gospel from being proclaimed and acted upon as it was by the early church. Fact number 49. One tradition is that God wills some of his children to suffer sickness and that, therefore, many who are prayed for are not healed because it's not his will to heal them. When Jesus healed the demon-possessed boy in Mark chapter 9, whom the disciples could not heal, see verse 18, he proved that it's God's will to heal even those who fail to receive healing. Furthermore, he assigned the failure of the disciples to cure the boy not to God's will, but to the disciples' unbelief, see Matthew 17, verses 19 and 20. Fact number 50. The failure of many to be healed today when prayed for is never because it's not God's will to heal them. Fact number 51. If sickness is the will of God, then every physician would be a lawbreaker, every trained nurse a defier of the Almighty, and every hospital a house of rebellion instead of a house of mercy. Fact number 52. Since Christ came to do the Father's will, the fact that he healed them all is proof that it is God's will for all to be healed. Fact number 53. If it is not God's will for all to be healed, how did everyone in the multitudes obtain from Christ what it was not God's will for them to receive? The gospel says he healed them all. Fact number 54. If it is not God's will for all to be healed, why do the scriptures state, with his stripes we are healed, and by whose stripes ye were healed? Isaiah 53, 5, 1 Peter 2, 24. How could we and ye be declared healed if it's God's will for some of us to be sick? Fact number 55. Christ never refused those who sought his healing. Repeatedly, the gospel tells us that he healed them all. Christ the healer has never changed. Fact number 56. Only one person in the entire Bible ever asked for healing by saying, If it be thy will. That was the poor leper to whom Jesus immediately responded, I will be thou clean. See Mark chapter 1 verses 40 and 41. Fact number 57. Another tradition is that we can glorify God more by being patient in our sickness than by being healed. 
If sickness glorifies God more than healing, then any attempt to get well by natural or divine means would be an effort to rob God of the glory that we should want Him to receive. Fact number 58. If sickness glorifies God, then we should rather be sick than well. Fact number 59. If sickness glorifies God, Jesus robbed his father of all the glory that he possibly could by healing everyone. See Luke 4.40. And the Holy Spirit continued doing the same throughout the Acts of the Apostles. See Acts 5.16. Fact number 60. In 1 Corinthians 6.20, Paul said, Ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Fact number 61. Our bodies and our spirits are bought with a price. We are to glorify God with both. Fact number 62. We do not glorify God in our spirit by remaining in sin. We do not glorify God in our body by remaining sick. Fact number 63. John 11.4 is used to prove that sickness glorifies God. But God was not glorified in this case until Lazarus was raised up from the dead, the result of which was many of the Jews believed on him. See verse 45. Fact number 64. Another tradition is that while God heals some, it's not his will to heal all. But Jesus, who came to do the Father's will, did heal them all. Fact number 65. If healing is not for all, why did Jesus bear our sicknesses, our pains, and our diseases? If God wanted some of his children to suffer, then Jesus relieved us from bearing something which God wanted us to bear. But since Jesus came to do the will of the Father, and since he hath borne our diseases, it must be God's will for all to be well. Fact number 66. If it's not God's will for all to be healed, then God's promises to heal are not for all. That would mean that faith does not come by hearing the word of God alone, but by getting a special revelation that God has favored you and wills to heal you personally. Fact number 67. If God's promises to heal are not for all, then we could not know what God's will is by reading his word alone. That means we would have to pray until he speaks directly to us about each case in particular. We could not consider God's word as directed to us personally, but would have to close our Bibles and pray for a direct revelation from God to know if it's his will to heal each case. That would be absurd. God's will is for all. Fact number 68. God's word is his will. God's promises reveal his will. When we read of what he promises to do, we then know what it is his will to do. Fact number 69. Since it's written, faith cometh by hearing the word of God, then the best way to build faith in your heart that God is willing to heal you is for you to hear that part of God's word which promises you healing. Fact number 70. Faith for spiritual healing cometh by hearing the gospel. He bore our sins. Faith for physical healing cometh by hearing the gospel. He bore our diseases. Fact number 71. We are to preach the gospel that he bore our sins to every creature. We are to preach the gospel that he bore our sicknesses to every creature. Fact number 72. In John 14, verses 12 to 14, Christ emphasized his promise, If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. He repeated it twice. He did not exclude healing from this promise. Anything includes healing. This promise is for all. Fact number 73. If healing is not for all, Christ should have qualified his promise in Mark 11:24 24 accordingly and said, What things soever ye desire, accept healing. When you pray, believe that you receive them and ye shall have them. But he did not. Healing, therefore, is included in the what things soever. This promise is made to you. Fact number 74. If it's not God's will to heal all, the promise in John 15, 7 would not be dependable where Christ said, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Fact number 75. 
James 5, verses 14 and 15 says, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. This promise is for all, including you, if you are sick. Fact number 76. If God today has abandoned healing in answer to prayer in favor of healing only by medical science, as modern theology speculates, that would mean that he requires us to use a less successful method during a better dispensation. He healed them all then, but today many diseases are incurable by medical science. Fact number 77. Paul tells us that God would have us prepared unto every good work, 2 Timothy 2.21, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, 2 Timothy 3.17, and that we may abound to every good work, 2 Corinthians 9 and 8. A sick person cannot measure up to these scriptures. These conditions would be impossible if healing is not for all. Either healing is for all or these scriptures do not apply to all. Fact number 78. Bodily healing in the New Testament was called a mercy, and it was God's mercy which always moved him to heal all the sick. His promise is that he is plenteous in mercy unto all that call upon him. Psalms 86, 5. That includes you today. Fact number 79. The correct translation of Isaiah 53, 4 is, Certainly, or surely he hath borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. To prove that our sicknesses were carried away by Christ, just like our sins were carried away, the same Hebrew verb for born and carried is used to describe both sickness and sin. See verses 11 and 12. Fact number 80. Christ was made to be sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5.21, when he bare our sins, 1 Peter 2.24. Christ was made a curse for us, Galatians 3.13, when he bare our sicknesses, Matthew 8.17. Fact number 81. Since Christ bare our sins, how many is it God's will to forgive? The answer, whosoever believeth. Since Christ bare our diseases, how many is it God's will to heal? Answer, he healed them all. Fact number 82. Another tradition is that if we are righteous, we should expect sickness as a part of our life. They quote the scripture, Psalms 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But this does not mean sicknesses, as some would have us believe. It means trials, hardships, persecutions, temptations, and so forth, but never sicknesses or physical disabilities. Fact number 83. It would be a contradiction to say, Christ hath borne our sicknesses, and with his stripes we are healed, but then add, many are the sicknesses of the righteous which he requires us to bear. Fact number 84. To prove this tradition, theologians quote, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. 1 Peter 5.10 This suffering does not refer to suffering sickness, but to the many ways in which God's people have so often had to suffer for their testimony. See Acts chapter 5 verse 41 and 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Fact number 85. Another tradition is that we are not to expect healing for certain afflictions. People quote the scripture, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. James 5.13 This again does not refer to sickness, but to the same things as pointed out in fact number 82 above. Fact number 86 Another tradition is that God chastises his children with sickness. The scripture in Hebrews 12, verses 6 to 8 is quoted, a part of which says, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. God does chasten those whom he loves, but it does not say that he makes them sick. The word chasten here means to instruct, train, discipline, teach, or educate, like a teacher instructs a pupil, or like a father trains and teaches a child. Fact number 87. 
When a teacher instructs a student, various means of discipline may be employed, but never sickness. When a father trains his child, he chastens by different means, but never by imposing a physical disease upon it. For our Heavenly Father to chasten us does not require that He lay a disease upon us. Our diseases were laid upon Christ. God could not require that we bear as punishment what Jesus has substitutionally borne for us. Christ's sacrifice freed us forever from the curse of sin and disease which He bore on our behalf. Fact number 88. The most common tradition is the worn-out statement, the age of miracles is past. For this to be true, there would have to be a total absence of miracles. Even one miracle would prove that the age of miracles is not past. Fact number 89. If the age of miracles is past, no one could even be born again, because the new birth is the greatest miracle a human being can experience. Fact number 90. If the age of miracles is passed, as some claim, that would mean that all the technical evidence produced in hundreds of laboratories of the world concerning innumerable cases of miraculous healings is false, and that God's promises to do such things are not for today. Fact number 91. Anyone who claims that the age of miracles is passed denies the need, the privileges, and the benefits of prayer. For God to hear and answer prayer, whether the petition is for a postage stamp or for the healing of a cripple, is a miracle. If prayer brings an answer, that answer is a miracle. If there are no miracles, there's no reason for faith. If there are no miracles, prayer is a mockery, and only ignorance would cause anyone to either pray or accept an answer. God cannot answer prayer without a miracle. If we pray at all, we should expect that prayer to be answered. If that prayer is answered, God has done it. And if God has answered prayer, He has performed something supernatural. That is a miracle. To deny miracles today is to make a mockery of prayer today. Fact number 92. The age of miracles is not past because the miracle worker has never changed. Hebrews 13 and 8 says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Fact number 93. When Jesus sent his disciples to preach the gospel, he told them, These supernatural signs shall follow them that believe. This was for every creature, for all nations, until the end of the world. The end of the world has not come yet, so the age of miracles has not passed. Christ's commission has never been withdrawn or annulled. Fact number 94. Christ's promise for the Spirit that it shall be saved is in the Great Commission and is for all. Christ's promise for the body that it shall recover is in the Great Commission and is for all. To deny that one part of the Great Commission is for today is to deny that the other part is for today. As long as the Great Commission is in effect, the unsaved can be healed spiritually and sick people can be healed physically by believing the gospel. Multiplied thousands of sincere people all over the world are receiving the benefits of both physical and spiritual healing through their simple faith in God's promises. Fact number 95. Christ bore your sins so that you may be forgiven. Eternal life is yours. Claim this blessing and confess it by faith. God will make it good in your life. Fact number 96. Christ bore your diseases so that you may be healed. Divine health is yours. Claim this blessing and confess it by faith. God will manifest it in your body. Fact number 97. Like all of Christ's redemptive gifts, healing must be received by simple faith alone, without natural means, and upon being received, must be consecrated for Christ's service and glory alone. Fact number 98. Since Romans 8.32 is true today, God is as willing to heal believers as He is to forgive unbelievers. That is to say, if when you were unsaved, God was willing to forgive you, now that you are his child, he's willing to heal you. If he was merciful enough to forgive you when you were unconverted, he is merciful enough to heal you now that you are in his family. Fact number 99. 
You must accept God's promises as true and believe that you are forgiven before you can experience the joy of spiritual healing. You must accept God's promise as true and believe that you are healed before you can experience the joy of physical healing. Fact number 100. As many sinners as received him were born of God. John 1, 12 and 13. As many sick people as touched him were made whole. Mark 6, 56. When we preach it is always God's will to heal. The question is immediately raised, how then could we ever die? God's word says, thou taketh away their breath, they die and return to their dust. Psalms 104, 29. And Job 5, 26 says, thou shalt come to thy grave in a full age, like as a shock of corn cometh in his season. For us to come to our full age and for God to take away our breath does not require the aid of a cancer or any other disease. God's will for your death as his child is that after living a fruitful, full life, fulfilling the number of your days, you simply stop breathing and fall asleep in Christ to awaken on the other side and live forever with him. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says, So shall you ever be with the Lord. Indeed, this is the blessed hope of the righteous. Psalms 91 verses 14 to 16 gives this record of wonderful promises. God says, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. The author says the second step to receive miracle healing is to know God's promises to heal in the scriptures and to be convinced that they are for you personally. How God Speaks to You Many times religious teachers do us more harm than good because they make a philosophy or a doctrine of scriptural truth when it's meant to be as though the Lord were here speaking to us. The Word is His voice. It has the same authority. When you read the Bible, remember that you're having a personal conversation with the Lord. The absolute integrity of God's written Word is the only basis for consistent faith. One of the greatest errors committed by people today is in treating the Word of God as though it were an ordinary book. You should give God's Word the same place you'd give Christ if He were physically in your presence. His Word talks to you and tells you the same things He would tell you if He spoke to you audibly. You cannot separate God from His Word. He's not only in it, a part of it, but he's back of it, and he continually watches over it to confirm it, to see that not one word fails. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 12, he says, I watch over my word to perform it. In 1 Kings 8, 56, there's not failed one word of all of his good promises which he hath promised. In Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. The angel said in Luke 1, 37, No word from God is void of power. Another translation says, No promise from God will be impossible of fulfillment. I like that. He is speaking to you. An old man lay dying in his shack in the jungle. A Christian woman read to him, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The old man opened his eyes and looked at the lady and asked, Is that in the Bible? She said, Yes. He said, Does it mean me? She said, Certainly it means you, sir. He lay there for a while thinking. Then he asked, Has God said anything else to me in that book? Then she read to him, As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Then she added softly, He's speaking to you, sir. The old man opened his eyes and whispered again, I accept him. I'm satisfied. Then he died. 
he treated God's written word as though Jesus Christ had visited his little shack in person and brought him the message of eternal life, and he was wonderfully saved and slipped out of this world in perfect peace. The promises you read in the Bible are God speaking to you personally. They're just as much yours as a check that's drawn on a bank which is made out to you. You can cash that check because it's yours. In the same way, you can claim God's promises in prayer because they are yours. After knowing that healing is a part of Christ's ministry today, you must then know that his promises to heal in the scriptures are made to you personally. God's word is personal. A man who had been deaf in one ear for 20 years came to me for prayer. I asked him if he believed God would heal his ear. He replied that he didn't know. I asked him, do you know that God has promised to heal you? He said, no, I don't know that. I said, do you believe that God's good enough to fulfill a promise he's made? He said, yes, sir, I sure do. I said, if I can show you in the Bible where God's promised to heal you personally, do you believe he'll do it? He said, yes, I do. I looked right in his eyes and quoted these promises. I am the Lord that heals you. And I asked him, who does you mean? Then I quoted, by whose stripes you were healed. And I asked him, who does you mean? And then I quoted, who heals all your diseases. And I asked him, who does your mean? And you know, he began to weep as he responded, now I believe. I see that God's promised to heal me. I believe he'll do it. Faith came to that man by hearing God's promises. Paul said in Romans 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing the word of God. I touched that man's ear in Jesus' name, asking God to open it according to his promise, and it immediately was healed. God's promises are just as much for you as they were for that man. The Bible says, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus said that. Anything includes healing, and you includes you. The Bible says in James, is any sick among you? The Lord shall raise him up. Any includes you. The promise, the Lord shall raise them up, is made without exception. It includes everybody. Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. This is for you if you believe. They shall recover is Christ's promise to everyone who's sick, without exception, including you. Do you believe God's promises are for you? If so, claim them in sincere prayer, and God will fulfill them. Don't doubt. Believe his word. It's as though he were speaking personally to you. Message number six. Why you can be healed. God announces in Exodus 15:26. I am the Lord who heals you. He is a healer. He wills to heal you. You may find it difficult to reconcile this with the fact of so much sickness in the world and with the fact that so many good and innocent people suffer. It may also be awkward to reconcile this truth with traditional religious teaching about sickness. But if you comprehend God's word of promise for you, you'll discover that his will is for you to enjoy physical health, spiritual salvation, and material abundance. No scripture could express God's will more clearly than this one in 3 John verse 2. I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. The Bible teaches that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he bore our physical infirmities, diseases, and pains in the same way that he bore our sins and our iniquities. Our substitute. The question is not, did he bear our physical diseases? The question is, why did he bear them? The same verb in both Hebrew and Greek used to state that Christ bore our spiritual iniquities is used to state that he bore our physical diseases. Then why did he bear our physical diseases? 
The answer constitutes the essence of what we call the good news. He did it so that you do not have to do it. He did it as your personal substitute. That's what the story of redemption is all about. That's why you can be healed. Message number seven, healing for everyone. The life of Christ includes physical health for you. It's God's will for you to be physically healed as well as to be spiritually saved. Psalms 103 verse 3 says, He forgives all your iniquities. He heals all your diseases. Both healing and forgiveness are gifts of God which are to be received by faith. Faith is expecting God to do what He promised to do. This is why faith comes by hearing the Word of God, according to Romans chapter 10, verse 17. God has given to us His great and abundant promises in order to reveal to us His will. His testament, or His will, or His promise, or His Word are all the same. In order to receive any blessing from God, it must come to us by faith. To have faith for any blessing, we must first be convinced that such a blessing is God's will for us. As long as we have a question about whether or not God wills that we receive something, we cannot have faith to accept it. His promise is His will. We're commanded to ask for things believing that we shall receive them. James chapter 1 verse 6 and 7 says, Ask in faith, nothing wavering. For the person that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that person think that they shall receive anything of the Lord. You can be saved when you believe God loves you and that Christ died for your sins and you're sure that it's therefore God's will and God's desire to forgive you. You can then accept this gift of new life by faith and you're born again. You know salvation is for whosoever will. It's for everyone. It's for you. Now, if you're sick, you must be convinced by the same promises of God that it's His will to heal you physically. Otherwise, you'll not be able to ask in faith. Religious tradition teaches that we should ask for healing by praying, if it be God's will. Consequently, very few people experience healing miracles. But God has abundantly promised physical healing for those who believe. I hope you'll get our book, Healing the Sick. Also, our living audio classic edition. We've recorded the entire book for you. He wills to heal all. The purpose of this message is to show you that it is God's will to heal everyone who will have faith in His promises, and that, my friend, includes you right now. Clearly, according to the Bible, God's salvation includes physical health for God's glory. Notice what happened shortly after Christ was raised from the dead. It's an example of what God's will is wherever the gospel is preached. In Acts chapter 5, verses 12 to 16, we read this. By the hands of the apostles, there were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes, both of men and women. Now, this happened after Christ had been crucified and had risen from the dead. Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets, laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about to Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits. And listen to this. They were healed, every one. Those words, they were healed, every one, reveal what God's will is today for all who are sick. This is a record of what was accomplished under Peter's ministry in Jerusalem after Jesus had returned to the Father. They were healed, every one. It's a testimony that Christ's ministry had not changed after his resurrection. They were healed. Every one was a fulfillment of God's healing covenant. I am the Lord that heals you. You in that covenant included everyone in Jerusalem under Peter's ministry. 
they were healed. Every one was experienced by the entire nation of Israel. Psalms 105 verse 37 says, There was not one feeble person among their tribes. They were healed. Every one was experienced by everyone in the throngs which followed Jesus. Matthew 12, 15 says, Great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. They were healed. Every one. This is what happened to every one of the Israelites who were bitten by the fiery serpents in the wilderness. When they beheld the serpent of brass lifted up on a pole, a type of Calvary, they lived. You'll find that story in Numbers, the 21st chapter, verses 8 and 9. They were healed, every one. This is what happened when in Psalms 107, verse 20, God sent his word and healed them. That's the purpose of his word concerning healing being sent to you today, so that every one will be healed. They were healed. Everyone is the promise for today. It includes you. It will save you from premature death. Exodus 23 verse 25 says, God says, I will take sickness away from the midst of you. The number of your days I will fulfill. No exceptions. They were healed everyone. To make that possible for everyone to be healed, Galatians 3.13 says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. This curse included every sickness and every plague. It includes you. This blessing was provided for everyone at Calvary when the Bible says in Isaiah 53, certainly Christ suffered our pains and carried our diseases. Our includes everyone. They were healed, everyone. This was made possible because with Christ's stripes, we are healed. We includes everyone. They were healed, everyone. This was made possible when Christ himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Matthew 8, verse 17. Our includes everyone. They were healed, everyone. When Christ came down from heaven not to do the, his own will, but the will of him that sent him, he came and constantly healed them all. You can read it in Matthew chapter 12, verse 15, chapter 14, verse 36, Luke chapter 6, verse 19, Acts chapter 10, 38. In every one of those cases, he healed them all. His own ministry on earth established his will to heal everyone. They were healed. Everyone was the standard in Christ's ministry. It was what he promised to believers in John chapter 14, verse 12. When you believe on me, the works that I do, shall you do also. They were healed. Everyone was what Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, according to Acts chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Then the disciples continued to do that after he was taken up and seated at the Father's right hand. They were healed. Everyone is therefore the will of God now while Christ is seated in heaven. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. They were healed. Everyone is as much the will of God now as it is his will to forgive every sinner who repents. The Bible says he forgives all. And the Bible says he heals all. They were healed, everyone. This blessing is for every city. In Luke chapter 10, verses 8 and 9, Jesus said, In whatsoever city you enter, heal the sick that are therein. The sick includes everyone who's physically ill. They were healed, everyone. This puts whole cities to talking about Jesus and makes him the public center of attraction, as was the case in Jerusalem. They were healed. Everyone will bring multitudes to hear the gospel like it happened in Jerusalem. It'll also bring multitudes from surrounding towns and cities like it did in Acts chapter 5. They were healed. Everyone. In this way, multitudes, both of men and women, are added to the Lord, just like in Acts chapter 5, verse 14. The first miracle healing in Acts caused about 5,000 people to believe on Jesus Christ.
They were healed, everyone. That's one of the ways in which God bore witness to this great salvation, both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. This is the ministry which has caused multiplied thousands of non-Christians to believe the gospel in our crusades in nearly 70 countries of the world. Healing in the Bible They were healed, every one. The early church prayed for this before the sick were brought from the surrounding areas to the streets of Jerusalem for healing. They prayed for the Lord to stretch forth his hand to heal and to do signs and wonders. That's in Acts 4, verse 30. They were healed, every one, even the physically well and strong, united to bring this result about. The Bible says in Acts chapter 5, verse 1, they, meaning the well people, the strong people, the happy people, they brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches. They were healed, every one. This is what the whole church is to pray for in one accord, as the early church did in the Bible. You read in Acts chapter 4, verse 24, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord, and that's what they prayed for, and that's what they got. They were healed, every one. This was accomplished for all the sick when the sick didn't get as close to Peter as the people got to Jesus. The Bible says in Mark chapter 6, verse 56, that the people laid the sick in the streets and begged him to let them touch the border of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole. They didn't even get to touch Peter. Only the shadow of Peter passed over some of them, not all of them, some of them. Yet they were healed, every one, and there were multitudes of them. It sounds to me like this same Jesus who healed all the sick before he was crucified kept right on working with the disciples, healing all the sick after he was risen from the dead because it says they were healed, every one. This is the result the Holy Spirit interceded for it in Acts chapter 4, verse 24 to 30. And he accomplished it in Acts 5, verses 12 to 16. And then he recorded it so that every creature could hear and read about it and thus have faith for it to be repeated today. For all then, for all now. They were healed. Everyone would have included you had you been sick and present there that day. Healing, therefore, is for you today because God's will, which was executed in Jerusalem, has never changed. They were healed. Everyone. That included all of those who were vexed with unclean spirits then. So the demon-possessed are included in God's will for healing today. They were healed, every one. These words could not be used in recording Jesus' ministry at Nazareth. Mark chapter 6, verse 5 and 6 says, He could do there no mighty work, save that he laid his hands on a few sick folks and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Only a few sick folks were healed in Nazareth when Jesus was there. Now listen, where the individual's attitude was wrong, the result under Jesus' ministry were less than those under Peter's ministry when the individual's attitude was right. They were healed, everyone. This can be the same today when everyone believes the truth about healing. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 32, You shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. If everyone who is sick knows the truth at the same time, then everyone who is sick can be made whole at the same time. They were healed. Everyone. This is included in Christ's promise. Anyone who comes to me, I will not cast him or her out. You'll find that in John chapter 6, verse 37. Every sick person in Jerusalem and from the cities round about Jerusalem and in the villages, cities, and country proved that this blessing was for them. They were healed, everyone. To extend this blessing to you, Christ commands you in Mark eleven twenty two, have faith in God. His words to you are in Matthew nine twenty nine, according to your faith, be it done unto you. He promises in Mark eleven twenty four, when you pray, believe that you receive the things you ask for, and you shall have them. 
He says in John 15 verse 7, Ask what you will, and it shall be done to you. They were healed, everyone. This is God's will today. It is His will for you right now. He promises in Matthew 7 verse 8, Everyone that asks receives. This message of good news is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes, according to Romans 1.16. That includes you. I can't explain how Jesus suffered your diseases and your pains on his cross so many years ago. It's not logical or reasonable. Perhaps that's why 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to them which are saved it is the power of God. But when you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth what the Bible says that Jesus did for you on his cross, then God will confirm it by his miracle power. Jesus said, Only believe. Christ paid for your perfect and complete healing when he died for you in your place. He's the Lord who heals all your diseases. He paid for your healing when, according to Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 and 5, he carried your diseases and suffered your pains, taking the stripes by which you were healed. Now, on the cross, he said, it's finished. Your health is paid for. Your diseases were laid on him. He took them away forever. Healing belongs to you now. It's a gift. It's yours. Satan has no right to lay on you what God laid on Jesus at the cross. What Christ bore we need never bear. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 8 says, For the transgression of my people was Jesus stricken. Verse 10 says, It pleased the Lord to bruise him and to make his soul an offering for our sin. Verse 11, For he shall bear their iniquities, our iniquities. Hebrews 9.28 says, He bore the sins of many, or in other words, he bore our sins. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, He was wounded for the transgressions that we had committed. He was bruised for the iniquities that we had committed. The chastisement or punishment for our transgressions and our iniquities was put upon him. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. The Bible says in Isaiah 53 verse 4, Certainly he bore our sicknesses and carried our pains. Verse 5 says, With his stripes we are healed. Naturally, if he suffered our suffering, then we don't have to suffer because he did it in our place and we are free. The crux of the gospel message is that what he did on the cross as our substitute, he did in our name, in our place, so that we are free and we never have to suffer what he suffered for us. Matthew chapter 8 verse 17, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Why? So that we don't have to do it, so that we can be healed and enjoy his help and his happiness. 1 Peter 2.24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Why? So that we, being dead to sins, should live to righteousness. We're dead to sins because he took our sins. Our sins have been punished, and you cannot punish a crime twice. Our sins were punished in Jesus. He bore our sins, our punishment, so by his stripes we were healed, spiritually, mentally, and physically. When sin entered the human family, sickness logically followed. Medical science emphasizes the profound influence which the human spirit and the mental attitude have on the physical body and the nervous system. The devastation of deceit and evil, the decadence of lust and envy, the destruction of hatred and vengeance, the corruption of sin and rebellion all imposed their destructive toll on the human body. 
It's constantly poisoned by the fountain of negative and depraved attitudes. Salvation and healing are free gifts from God to rescue and heal you, not only from the evil and sin of your heart and spirit, but from their terrifying physical effects upon your entire body. That's why the Bible says, who his own self bear our own sins. Why? So that we may be saved. That's why the Bible says, himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Why? So that we may be healed and be made whole. Forgiveness of sins and physical healing are both part of our great salvation. Spiritual and physical healing, according to God's word, are both to be received together. Salvation includes both. The spirit and the body need healing. Jesus always healed both, and he does it now for you. Physical and spiritual healing. Psalms 103, verse 3. He forgives all your iniquities. He heals all your diseases. Matthew 9, verse 5. Which is easier to say, your sins be forgiven, or arise and walk? Matthew chapter 13, verse 15 says, The people's heart is waxed gross. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes have been closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and be converted, and I should heal them. James 5, verses 14, 15 says, Is anyone sick among you? The prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord shall raise him up. And if he or her have committed any sins, they shall be forgiven. Clearly, the healing which God offers through the cross of Christ is total health for the whole person, physical, spiritual, and mental. And that health is for you right now. Now Dr. Osborne will share part three of his audio book, which contains four messages dealing with the subject, The Killer. The author says the third step to receive miracle healing is to understand that God wants you to be well, that only Satan wants you to suffer. Now here's Dr. Osborne with his message number nine, The Source of Disease. The faith of many who seek healing from Christ is hindered by the idea that God may have some purpose in their suffering, that perhaps their sickness has been put on them by God and that they should have patience, not insist on healing. Thousands of good people suffer needlessly for years and die prematurely because of this attitude. In order to clear our minds of these teachings, we need to understand that sickness is from Satan and not from God, that Satan's put it on us and not God. I preached the gospel for seven years before I heard anyone say that sickness came from the devil. This statement made me think, and I began to search the scriptures about this, and I discovered some facts which I'd never known before. Satan's part in disease. Job chapter 2 verse 7 was a verse that first captured my attention. So Satan went forth and smote Job with sore boils. Here, sickness was brought to Job directly by Satan. Then I noticed Luke chapter 13, verses 11 to 16. Jesus said to a woman who was bent over, Satan has bound her. And he said that she had a spirit of infirmity. Then I remembered Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. Blindness was caused by a devil. And when Jesus cast out the devil, the blind man could see. I recalled that a boy who had had convulsions and was deaf and dumb was perfectly whole after a demon had been cast out of him. That's in Mark chapter 9, verses 25 to 27. Then I found that important scripture which so many have overlooked in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Jesus went about healing all that were oppressed of the devil. This scripture affirms that all the sick people whom Christ healed had been oppressed by the devil. In other words, in those days, sickness was identified as Satan's oppression. 
I heard a Bible teacher explain something about healing that I'd never heard before in all my life. It was very reasonable and helped me to understand the ministry of healing so clearly that my entire life and ministry were changed in a few hours. He explained Satan's part in disease like this. A spirit of infirmity. He said, every disease has a life, a germ. That germ is from Satan because it destroys. It's what Jesus called a spirit of infirmity. That germ causes the disease to grow, just like the germ of life from our conception caused us to grow and become a human body. When that germ or life leaves our body, then our body will die. It'll decay and return to the dust. Likewise, when the spirit of a disease leaves, the disease dies and it'll decay and disappear. Then that man kept on explaining. He said, those who've received Christ by faith and have become part of God's family have power over the spirit of the devil that brings disease. Jesus said, in my name you shall cast out devils. In his name, we have absolute authority to command the life of disease to leave the body of one who trusts in Christ. That spirit must obey us. When it leaves, then the disease dies and the effects of it will disappear. Then that man kept on explaining and he used this illustration. He said, for example, a cancer has a life in it. That life is of the devil because it destroys and kills. As long as that life is there, the cancer will continue its work of destruction. But when the life of the cancer is commanded to leave in Jesus' name, it must go. Then the cancer's dead. It'll decay and pass away, and the sick person will recover. Our lives were changed. When I heard that truth, my whole attitude toward physical healing by Christ changed. I then knew I could pray for sick people, I could rebuke the spirits of their disease in Jesus' name and command them to leave. I knew that their sicknesses would then die and that they would recover just like Jesus said when he said, In my name, believers shall cast out devils, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Well, we began inviting sick people to our meetings. We instructed them thoroughly in the word of God, and then we prayed for them, rebuking the spirits of infirmities and commanding them to leave the sick people in Jesus' name. And the diseases died, and the sick people were healed. Christ confirmed his word, and God was glorified, not only in the healing of the sick, but in the salvation of many souls. We have many times led more souls to Christ in one day by including the healing part of the gospel in our message than we did in all of those seven years combined before we proclaimed Christ as healer. We rebuked the blind spirit which had caused a cataract in a man's eye. The blind spirit left, the cataract died, and in a few days, as the white growth disappeared, the blind man could see as good as ever. Normal sight was restored. We rebuked the deaf spirit which had caused a man to be deaf, commanding it to leave in Jesus' name, and the deaf man received hearing instantly. We commanded the life of a cancer to leave a woman. The cancer died and the sick woman got well. The sick recovered just as Jesus promised they would. We soon began hearing reports everywhere. I was prayed for, and now I'm healed. I had a tumor, now it's gone. The cancer's disappeared from my body. New faith was evidenced in our church, and its influence spread for hundreds of miles all around. We had taken the Bible promises seriously and were ministering to the complete person. Christ was working with us, just like it says in Mark 16, verse 20, confirming his word with signs following. This has been our life's work now for decades. We're still acting on Christ's instructions with the authority and power he's given us over spirits of devils and diseases. We're rebuking those spirits of infirmities which cause diseases, commanding them to leave the bodies of the sick. The sick people are recovering and thousands of souls are accepting the gospel and receiving Christ as Savior in every mass crusade we conduct. We say these things to show that the miraculous power of Christ, when manifested today in the healing of the sick, causes thousands of souls to believe on Christ as Savior, just as it did in Bible days. 
The Bible says in Acts chapter 5, verse 14, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women. This happened when they brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches. And the Bible says they were healed, every one. As long as you think that your sickness may be from God, you won't resist it. As long as you think God may have a purpose in your sickness, you won't rebuke it. But when you understand what the scriptures clearly teach, that sickness is from Satan, you'll resist it and rebuke it and refuse it, and it'll leave you as you trust in Jesus Christ. The Source of Sickness Doctors may call the disease which stiffens the joints arthritis or rheumatism, but an oppressing spirit of the devil is the scriptural cause. The proper medical term for deafness may be dead ear nerves, but from God's point of view, the real trouble is a spirit of deafness. Medical science may diagnose the case of a lad who can't talk, undeveloped vocal cords, but the Bible term is a dumb spirit. The specialist may say glaucoma or cataracts are the cause of a person's blindness, but Jesus called it a blind spirit. A totally blind lady was brought to us for prayer. The doctor said her optical nerves were dead, and from a medical standpoint, they were right. For 15 years, she had walked in total blindness with a seeing-eye dog. We rebuked the spirit of blindness which had destroyed her sight in Jesus Christ's name. It left her, and the lady screamed with joy. Oh, now I see I'm healed. That woman's sight was restored instantly. In Jamaica, a woman was hauled to our meeting in an old wheelbarrow by three other women. She had suffered, according to the doctors, a complete stroke of paralysis. She had lain lifeless for four days and nights without even swallowing water or food. Her eyes were rolled back in her head and her body appeared to be dead except for the faint pulse of her heart. We rebuked the spirit that had paralyzed her and commanded it to leave her. Then I called in a loud voice, Vida, open your eyes and be made whole in Jesus' name. She was instantly healed. In a few minutes, she was on her feet and walked home sound and well. The cause of her illness was a spirit of infirmity, which had been sent by Satan to kill and destroy her life, like the Bible says in John chapter 10, verse 10. But God healed her by the life of Jesus Christ. Cutting the Lifeline On the farm, we used to chop a deep groove around a tree to kill it. Though the leaves didn't wither instantly, we knew that we had dealt the death blow to the tree and that it would die, and it always did. So it is with disease. Jesus gave us power and authority over all disease, according to Mark chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, and many other verses. In his name, believers have the authority to rebuke diseases, and they'll die. Perhaps the symptoms, like the leaves on the tree, don't disappear immediately, but when we've prayed with faith and we've rebuked the life of the disease, we know that the sickness has been destroyed from the roots and that the outward symptoms will disappear. Jesus rebuked a fig tree which bore no figs. He spoke to the tree in Mark chapter 11, verses 12 to 14, no one shall eat fruit of you hereafter forever. He knew the life of the tree died at that moment and that the tree would wither. The following day, they passed by the tree again and saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Peter, suddenly remembering what the Lord had said to the tree the day before, explained in amazement, Master, behold, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. You'll read that in Mark chapter 11, verses 20 and verse 24. He was surprised. Jesus replied, Have faith in God. He had expected the tree to wither. If we know that Satan brings disease that a spirit of infirmity is the life of the sickness, then we can calmly rebuke it in Jesus' name, commanding the spirit of infirmity to leave, 
and we can be sure that the disease is then dead. We don't doubt because we don't see the green leaves or symptoms wither immediately. We know the life of the sickness is gone, that the disease is dead from the roots, and so we rejoice in faith while the outward symptoms disappear. Knowing this, you've come to understand that God wants you to be well. Message number 10. Satan spoiled the plan. God created man and woman perfect physically, mentally, spiritually, and he placed them in the Garden of Eden, a place of happiness, tranquility, and abundance. That was God's plan for you. If he had willed that this most beautiful creation formed in his own image should be disabled or diseased, would he have created them in such physical perfection? Then sin came. Satan, the tempter, persuaded Adam and Eve to doubt God's word. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, Satan said, Has God said, as a question, Has God said thus and so? They concluded that God did not mean what he said when he warned that disobedience would bring upon them the penalty of death. So they disobeyed his word and therefore had to be expelled from the paradise which God had created for them to enjoy. From that day, they were Satan's slaves. All that was perfect began to deteriorate. Happiness turned to sadness, love to hatred. Life was plagued by disease and eventual death. Beauty faded. Faith turned to distrust and confidence to deception. Those healthy bodies became subject to the manipulation of Satan, who, according to John 10 and 10, came to steal and to kill and to destroy. Pain and suffering, disease and sickness, deterioration and infirmity became an incurable curse until the only relief from this torture chamber was death itself, the final blow to God's human creation. The twin evils of sin and sickness have walked hand in hand throughout all generations since Adam and Eve. Physical beauty and health have been scarred by every imaginable form of disease. The human mind and heart have deteriorated with sin and corruption. In spite of the golden triumphs of medical science and the almost prodigious achievements of modern surgical procedures, human beings are still menaced by the vicious prospect of diseases for which there's still no cure. Message number 11, Harvest of Suffering. It was never God's plan for humankind, whom he created in perfection, to be sick or weak or to suffer. The problem of sickness and physical weakness came when temptation came to Adam and Eve and they yielded to it. Sin was conceived. They were driven out from God's presence. The seeds of sin grew and produced evil in their hearts. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. God saw that wickedness was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually, and it grieved him. Disharmony and deceit, jealousy and hatred, evil and lust, Violence and murder disrupted the entire structure of the human spirit and mind. This discord produced an ever-growing, menacing harvest of physical pain, suffering, disease, and deterioration. Deuteronomy chapter 28 outlines the awful penalty and the curse of disobedience to God. It enumerates a list of specific physical diseases which people suffer. Then a comprehensive footnote is added to the catalog in verse 61 of chapter 28 of Deuteronomy. Quote, also every disease and every plague which is not written in the book of this law, unquote. That includes every sickness. But God who is love and life God, who created man and woman in his own image, could not give up on his love plan. 
at the very time they were rebelling against him, being driven out of his presence and sinking into depravity and despair, his immense love drove him to find a way to buy back or to redeem his creation from Satan who had defrauded them. God's own law made it clear that whoever sinned must be punished. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4, the soul that sins shall die. In Romans 6 23, the wages of sin is death. But Romans 5 verse 12 says, but all had sinned. So all must suffer and all must die. Only an innocent, sinless one could be a substitute for the guilty. Therefore, God loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son as a ransom for you. Jesus Christ, the innocent one, suffered the penalty which the guilty deserved to suffer. Message number 12, the good news. The gospel is good news. What good news? It's the good news of what Jesus did for you on the cross. He bore the punishment for your sins. Why? so that you don't need to be punished. The great redemptive chapter of Isaiah, chapter 53, says, Certainly Christ bore our sicknesses and carried our pains. When he suffered our penalty on the cross, Isaiah says that the people esteemed that this man, Jesus, was being punished by God. But the redemptive fact is, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. If he suffered our diseases and bore our pains, then logically we are healed. What marvelous freedom. That's the same as to say, your friend paid all of your debts, and by his payment, you don't have a debt anymore. Your debt doesn't exist. Once it's paid in full, it's gone. You have no more obligation. You can't pay the same debt twice. Once paid, it's wiped out. The message of the gospel is good news that your debt is paid. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 says, For the Eternal has consecrated me and sent me with good news for needy people, to heal the brokenhearted, to tell the prisoners that they are free, to tell the captives they are released. Now Dr. Osborne is ready to begin the fourth part of this audio book, which will contain five messages dealing with the subject, the condition for being healed. The author says, The fourth step to receive miracle healing is to understand that physical healing is a part of salvation. Now here's Dr. Osborne with message number 13. Welcome the healer. We cannot separate Jesus, the healer, from Jesus, the Savior, so we cannot separate divine healing from salvation. The best way to receive healing for your body is to receive healing for your spirit. The sure way to receive healing for your body is to welcome Jesus, the healer, into your life. If you called a medical expert to aid your dying loved one, you'd gladly receive that physician into your house upon arrival, wouldn't you? So in seeking Christ's healing, welcome the healer into your life. We've had the joy of seeing thousands of people miraculously healed of all manner of disease and physical disability. Always, before we pray for the healing of sick bodies, we give the sick the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as the healer of their souls. After accepting the healer into their lives, then they can receive his healing for their bodies. Receive Christ. Receive the healer. For three weeks, a man attended one of our campaigns who had never received Christ. During every meeting that he attended, he ignored our admonition to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and to serve him. Although he always repeated the prayer for healing, he received no answer. He wanted healing, but he didn't want the healer to live in his life. After three weeks, the word of God convinced him of his sin and of his need of Christ. Later, he testified, I made my decision to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of my life, and I called on Him to come into my life. He cleansed me from all of my sin. After the prayer for salvation, as I heard Mr. Osborne tell us that the same Christ who had healed us of our sins would now heal us of our diseases, I suddenly realized that He'd already healed me. Here was a man who had prayed for three weeks to be healed, 
but had received nothing because he rejected Jesus, who's the healer. When he finally decided to receive Jesus as his Lord and Savior, Christ healed him completely even before he had a chance to ask. I've seen this happen thousands of times. Another man came to accept Christ, and he had two ruptures and one deaf ear. While he was thanking God for healing his soul and for forgiving his sins, Christ the healer who had entered his life healed his body completely even before he asked him for healing. He was saved. His blindness left. An old man in Central America who repented of his sins and received Christ into his heart and life was instantly healed of total blindness at the moment the healer entered his life. When he testified to what Christ had done for him, he explained, Christ has come in. He's right here in my heart. Then he continued. He pounded his chest. He said, lay your hand right here. You can feel him. He's here. I can see everything. He's opened my eyes. I'm saved. I'm healed. God's order for blessing our lives is, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Forgiveness for our sins comes first. Then healing for our diseases follows. The first blessing Christ pronounced upon the paralytic in Mark chapter 2 was, Your sins are forgiven you. Then he said, Arise, take up your bed, and go your way into your house. It was forgiveness first, and then physical healing. God's condition for his healing covenant is in Exodus 23, verse 25. You shall serve the Lord your God. Then he adds, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. Healing comes from the healer. He heals from within. Receive him and you'll receive his healing, which is part of his abundant life. You could never receive healing while rejecting the healer. A man asked me, will you pray for me to be healed? Sure, I said. And then I asked him, have you accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life? He shocked me, emphatically said no. Well, I asked, why do you ask God to heal you when you don't love him enough to serve him? Why should you ask God for more strength to serve the devil? Then I said to him, if you'll serve God, he'll heal your body. But if you refuse to serve him by refusing to receive Christ into your life, you shouldn't expect him to heal your body. The man thought this over intelligently, made his decision. Would you believe? Accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, was joyfully converted and instantly healed. You may be one who desires healing for your body, yet maybe you've never had a definite experience of receiving Jesus Christ into your life, of being reborn, being saved. If so, now's the time to be saved. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, Now is accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The New Birth Miracle If you've never accepted Jesus Christ by a definite act of faith, at a definite time, remember that the Bible says in Romans 3, verse 23, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Luke chapter 13, verse 5, Jesus said, Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Isaiah 59, verse 2 says, Your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear you. But I've got good news for you. Matthew chapter 26, verse 28 says, The blood of Jesus Christ was shed for many for the remission of sins. And Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 says, You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save you from your sins. And 1 John 1 and 9 says, If you confess your sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You see, according to these scriptures, if we've not accepted Christ's forgiveness for our sins, we're separated from God and he'll not hear us. But through his shed blood, we have remission and cleansing for our sins if we'll humble ourselves, confess our sins to him, and accept him now by faith into our lives. Jesus said, you must be born again. And Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creature. Old things are passed away and all things become new. This is the miracle of the new birth. 
Christ enters your life and you're made new because he begins to live in you. That is accepting Christ. He's a person, not a philosophy. He's a reality, not a religion. When I married and accepted Daisy, my wife, into my life, I didn't get the marriage religion. I received a person. I received Daisy, my wife. And when I was saved or reborn by receiving Christ into my life, I didn't get the Christian religion. I received a person. I received the Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior. My conversion was as definite an experience as was my marriage. On both occasions, I accepted another person into my life. When you understand what salvation means, then to say, I don't know for sure if I'm saved or not, that's as unreasonable as to say, I don't know for sure if I'm married or not. Those who don't understand the full biblical meaning of salvation, when asked if they're saved, they may reply, well, I think so. I try to be saved, but I'm not sure about it. That's like saying, I think I'm married. I try to be married, but I'm not sure about being married. John said, we know we've passed from death into life. There are many things which you may never know. But you can know that you have Christ's life in you. You can know that you've been saved, that you're born again. Be sure and get my books, The Big Love Plan, and How to Be Born Again. They're very helpful. You shall be saved. Some may ask, how can I know that I am saved? How can I be sure that my sins are forgiven? The Philippian jailer asked Paul the same question in Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31. What must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved, sir. Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, Those who believe the gospel and are baptized shall be saved. Paul said in Romans 10, Verse 9, if you will confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And Peter said in Acts chapter 2, verse 21, whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Aren't those verses wonderful? And isn't salvation simple? Every one of those scriptures contains the promise, you shall be saved. So do what they say, and you can know that you've received Christ, that you've passed from death into life, that you are born again. Message number 14. God's Love Plan Here is an outline to guide you in understanding God's love plan of salvation. First, the principle of self-value. You are created in God's image to share His life, love, plan, and purpose, and you are therefore infinitely valuable to God. Ephesians 2 and 10 says you are God's workmanship. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says, God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them in his own image. The 8th Psalm verses 5 and 6 says, The Lord made you, listen to this, a little lower than God the original Hebrew word is God. The King James Version says angels. The Lord made you a little lower than angels. But listen, the original translation, the Lord made you a little lower than God and crowned you with glory and honor. The Lord gave you dominion over the works of his hands. He put all things under your feet. Believe it. Second, the basic problem in human life. Adam and Eve chose to not trust God's word. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16, 17, And the Lord commanded, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. Satan influenced them to distrust God's word. He contradicted God by saying in Genesis chapter 3 verse 4, you will not surely die. Now in Genesis 3 verse 6, the Bible says, Eve took of the fruit and ate it and gave some to her husband with her and he ate it. That was the original sin 
distrusting God's word. Third, the negative power of unbelief. To question God's integrity produces deterioration and death in human nature. Genesis 2, verse 17, God said, In the day that you disavow my instructions and eat the fruit I forbade, you will surely die. Romans 6, 23 says, The wages of sin, or disavowing the integrity of God's word, is death. Romans 5, 12 says, Whereas by one person sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all persons, for that all have sinned. Fourth, the love plan of God for you. God loved and valued you too much to let you die. He gave Jesus to be judged and condemned in your place to exempt you from all guilt. 2 Peter 3 and 9 says, God was not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. John 3.16 says, God so loved you, the world, you, that he gave his only begotten son for you, that whosoever, including you, that believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Romans 5 and 8 in the Living Bible says, But God showed his great love for you by sending Christ to die for you. And listen to this in Romans chapter 3, verses 21, 25, and 27 in the Living Bible. Now God says he will accept and acquit you. He'll declare you not guilty if you trust Jesus Christ to take away your sins. For God sent Jesus Christ to take the punishment for your sins and to end all God's anger against you. Your acquittal is not based on your own good deeds. It is based on what Christ has done and on your faith in him. Since no debt can be paid twice or no crime punished twice, you can be restored as though you had never done wrong. That's good news, isn't it? Since Jesus Christ suffered the penalty you deserved, and since he did it on your behalf, you're no longer guilty before God and need never be judged for any sin you've ever committed. The judgment you deserved was put on your substitute in your place, and that judgment can never be imposed on you again, neither now nor in the hereafter. That was God's love plan to save you and to restore you to the life and goodness that he originally designed for you. Fifth, the secret of identity with Christ. You are restored to God's life again when you receive Jesus Christ. When you identify with what Jesus Christ did and believe that he assumed all judgment for your sins in your place, in your name, this is what takes place. Number one, the righteousness of Jesus Christ is transferred to you and you are free of all guilt and all judgment. Number two, Jesus Christ comes and lives the life of God in and through you. Think of it. Number three, you become a new creature. Number four, you are restored to God according to his original plan. And number five, a supernatural power is given to you which makes you a child of God. It's a miracle. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 says, God made Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be made sin on our behalf, so that in him we might share the righteousness or life of God. What an exchange that is. John 1, verse 12 says, As many as receive Jesus Christ, God gives them power to become the children of God. That's for you right now. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If you are in Christ, you are a new creature. All things become new. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I am come that you, and he's talking to you, you might have life more abundantly. My friend, you are restored to friendship, fellowship, and life with God when you believe Jesus Christ and receive him. And that's the way you were designed to live. 1 John 1 verse 3, Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. 
Because this fourth step is so essential to your salvation, I want to help you understand what it means to receive Jesus Christ by faith. According to the Bible, this thing that we call faith is the most important of all. In your conversion, it means to only believe as Jesus said. All else is empty and meaningless if you do not have faith. You may recognize your sins, abhor them, and be repentant. You may ask forgiveness and make endless consecrations for Christian living and even say with your lips that you've accepted Christ. But unless you have faith in God, in His Word, in Jesus Christ, in His sacrificial death on the cross, and in His resurrection, you've not been truly born again. Romans 1.16 says the gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says by grace or unmerited favor or the goodwill of God that you cannot earn by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, For they that come to God must believe that He is, and then that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. For without faith it's impossible to please God. The Bible promises, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But this salvation must be accepted by faith. What faith means? Faith is believing that what God said is true. Faith means you expect God to do what He promised to do. That's why faith comes by hearing the Word of God. You must know what God promised to do before you can expect Him to do it. Once you know God's promise and expect Him to do it, that's faith. Faith is accepting God's promises and being so convinced that they are true that you act on them in spite of anything that contradicts them. What are we to believe? The answer, the gospel or the good news of what Jesus accomplished for us through his death on the cross and through his resurrection. The Bible makes many statements which seem incredible, but we're commanded to believe them. Jesus said, have faith in God. So accept these statements about Christ and his substitutionary sacrifice on the cross as being literally true, whether they seem reasonable or not. That is faith. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And then in 1 Peter 2.24, Jesus Christ Himself bore our own sins in His own body on the tree so that we being dead to sins should live to righteousness. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, God made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. The mystery of the gospel is that Christ died for us and endured all of the penalty of our sins, which was charged to our account, so that our debt is paid in full and therefore does not exist any longer. Why did Jesus Christ do this for us? Because we had sinned against God and had broken his law, which declares the soul that sinneth shall die, and the wages of sin is death. Beginning of the problem. Man and woman were created perfect, sinless, healthy, pure, happy, and they lived in a garden of plenty. They walked and talked with God and had no sense of inferiority, condemnation, guilt, or fear. Then Satan's temptation came. Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate the forbidden fruit. That was sin, and it had to be punished. So that's why Romans 5, verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all, for that all have sinned. Man and woman were driven out of God's presence from the Garden of Eden to live forever separated from God as slaves of Satan and to reap the terrible harvest of their sin, which was evil, hatred, envy, greed, murder, disease, heartache, failure, pain, poverty, defeat, and all of the works of the devil, the consequence of the root evil of sin.
God's law, which demanded that all who sin must die, could not be changed. Yet, 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, God was not willing, which means he didn't want anyone to perish, but that all should come to repentance. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 32 says, God has no pleasure in the death of them that dies. So that's why John 3.16 says, God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son for us who was perfect to die in our place, in our name, and bear our punishment so that whoever believes in Jesus or whoever believes that Jesus took their place and died for their sins would not perish but would have everlasting life. Jesus came down to our level and lived as a man, but without sin, so he was perfect. Being without sin, he became our substitute and suffered the penalty of our sins. We couldn't pay for our own sins and live because the penalty is death. All had sinned, so all had to die. That's why Jesus came. He had not sinned. He was conceived by a miracle of the Holy Ghost in which a divine seed was planted in the womb of the virgin named Mary. That's in Luke chapter 1, verses 28 to 32, and also verse 35. The man without sin. So, Jesus was not born of human seed, but of God's seed. Since the blood comes from the Father's seed, Jesus was divine. Since the life of the flesh is in the blood, according to the Bible, the life of Jesus was divine. He was God in the flesh. That's why Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, the angel said, Call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. That's why John pointed to him and said in John chapter 1, verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. When Jesus was condemned and crucified, that was a perfect and sinless substitute taking our place. God's own Son, in the flesh, with divine blood, died for us. In Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, God says, I have given the blood to you upon the altar to make atonement for the soul. In Matthew 26, verse 28, Jesus said, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Isaiah 53, verse 6 says, The Lord laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. Verse 8, For the transgression of us, Jesus was stricken. Verse 10, The soul of Jesus was made an offering for our sin. Verse 11, Jesus bore our iniquity. And verse 12, Jesus bore our sins and made intercession for us as transgressors. You see, all of that 53rd chapter of Isaiah includes you and me, Jesus, the perfect sinless substitute, taking our place, paying our debt for us, assuming our penalty, all the judgment of our sin, and taking that load of punishment and guilt and dying in our place, in our name, on our behalf, so that we could be free. That's the good news, the gospel. And because Jesus did that, then our sin cannot be punished the second time. So we are free. We're not guilty. If we believe on Jesus Christ and believe what the Bible says, that Jesus did that on our behalf. Faith in the Good News Although this is impossible for some to accept, this is the good news by which we are saved. You probably do not understand the North or South Poles and probably have not seen them, but you accept them. If you ever traveled on an airplane or crossed the seas, you proved your faith in those poles because you were guided by their influence. You probably don't understand your radio, telephone, electricity, or television, but you use them. They work for you. You rely on them. In the same way, you must believe the good news of Jesus Christ and believe that he took your place, suffered your sins, and bore the penalty of your guilt. On that cross, as he was dying, he said, It is finished. That means your debt cannot be paid twice. Your penalty cannot be suffered twice. Jesus did it in your name, on your behalf, 
for you, and now your salvation is complete. You are not guilty any longer from the minute that you tell the Lord that you believe the good news of what he did for you. So, when you believe the gospel, it means that you have faith in what Jesus did for you in his substitutionary death. The real issue, trust. Now comes the real issue. Do you believe the gospel message? Do you have faith in what Jesus did for you? How can you prove your faith in him? The answer is in one simple word, trust. Trust him. I say to you what I say to thousands who accept Christ in our mass crusades. Trust in the finished work of Christ for your spirit. Trust what he did for you. What else are you going to trust? I say, trust that he suffered enough for you and all of the sins that you ever committed. I said, enough. Trust that he suffered enough for you. Jesus paid the full and supreme price. No more needs to be paid. Trust that he did enough for you. Trust that he was perfect, that his blood was sinless. Trust that he was innocent and that he could take your place as your substitute. Trust that his blood was enough to wash away every sin of yours. Trust that nothing else needs to be done. No further price needs to be paid. No further penalty needs to be suffered. No good works or offerings or merits or sacrifices or penance needs to be added to what Christ did to redeem you. Trust that he did enough. Rest your faith forever on the foundation of what the Bible says that Jesus did for you. Once you've heard and believed the good news, once you've recognized your sins and repented of them, once you've confessed and turned your back on them, once you've come to God repenting of your sin and having asked his pardon, having expressed your faith in what Jesus did for you, once you've accepted Jesus Christ into your heart by faith and decided to live for him and have purposed to strive to please him in all that you think and say and do, then never again do anything or make any sacrifice or effort or pay any price or take any step ever to be saved. Trust Jesus Christ. Trust that he did enough at the cross. Trust his sacrifice. Trust that he paid your debt. Trust that he suffered enough. Trust his payment for your sin. Your offerings and good works will never improve your state of salvation. Trust the blood of God's Son. Trust in his love to reach you and in his power to save and redeem you. You can't help yourself trust what he did for you. Trust what he did at the cross. Nothing you can think or say or do now or in the future can ever add to what he did on the cross for you. That's the wonderful good news. Jesus paid enough. Jesus suffered enough. You and your penance or offerings cannot add to what he did for you. He did it for you so that you will never have to do anything more than only believe. Keep trusting. And when you come to your last day on earth and draw your last breath, in that moment, keep on trusting. Don't try to think or say or do anything to improve your salvation at that hour because what Jesus did nearly 2,000 years ago was enough. Trust what he did and you will be saved. That is what the Bible means by faith. As long as we try to improve our salvation by good works, offerings, suffering, penance, or any other thing, we are not believing the gospel. We are not trusting Christ. When I think of leaving this life and of standing before God, I shall not contemplate the value of anything I ever thought or said or did in life. It is all so insignificant so often flawed by mistakes, I could not dare count on my goodness for any merit before God. But when I stand before him, I shall depend only on what Jesus Christ did for me in my name on the cross. I shall remember only that he was perfect and that he died in my place. I shall think only 
of his sinless blood. God cannot reject the blood and life of his own son. His word says that the blood and righteousness of Jesus have been put over to my account and that God will only look at me and judge me in Christ. In other words, all of Christ's righteousness is transformed to my account. The Great Exchange the Living Translation of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For God took the sinless Christ and poured into him our sins. Then in exchange, he poured God's goodness into us. So when God examines me, he sees only the life of his own son. When I think of that, I'm calm. I'm secure. I have no fear. I'm at peace because I trust in Christ. I believe that he did enough. That is faith. Acts 16, verse 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Romans 4, verse 5, But they that work not, but believe on him that justifies the ungodly, their faith is counted for righteousness. Romans 5, verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39. But we are not of them who draw back to perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So right now, seal your experience with God forever by your faith in Him and His Word. Pray this prayer of confession to God after me. The Prayer for Salvation Say, My dear Lord, I do here and now believe on Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I believe that in your great mercy and love, you died for me as my substitute. Say this to him from the bottom of your heart. Say, I believe that you suffered all of the penalty of my sins and that you paid the full price so that there is no more sin laid to my charge. Oh, Lord, you were perfectly innocent. You did no wrong. I was the sinner. I broke God's law. The penalty of death was on me. I should have been crucified. But you loved me too much to let me die for my sins, Lord. Oh, God, even though I was separated from you by my sins and transgressions, you saw me in my helplessness, in my fallen state, and you loved me. You gave your son to die for me. Say this to the Lord right out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for taking my place and for paying my debt in full. Your precious blood was sinless and divine, yet it was shed for the remission of my sins. When you suffered my penalty, I was free. There remains no sins to condemn me, so there is now no reason for me to be guilty before you. Thank you, Lord. I can never be judged or sentenced for the sins that you died to pardon. They were judged in you, O oh my Lord. All of my sins and my old nature were put on your account, and you paid it all for me. Say it to him right out loud after me. Say, now all of your spotless righteousness is put to my account so that I am now redeemed and saved. Lord, I believe on Jesus Christ. I believe the good news of the cross. I thank you that I have received you into my life. I have accepted you today. I have accepted your righteousness. I have received your free gift of love and mercy and grace. I have accepted you as a person in me. Now I am a new creature. I am reborn from above with the divine life of Jesus. I trust in the blood of Jesus that it blots out every sin and transgression from my life. 
I trust that you did enough for me, Lord, that you paid the full price, that there can never be any further price for me to pay. Lord, you paid it all. I shall never make another effort or claim any merit or pay any price or offer any good works, nor shall I ever, as long as I live, I shall never think, I shall never say, I shall never do anything more to have my past sins forgiven or to try to be saved. Oh Lord, you did enough. Nearly 2,000 years ago, you paid it all. You paid the full price for all of my sins and for my salvation forever. So from this day, O oh Lord, I trust in what you did for me at the cross. It is enough. I am saved because of what you did for me. Nothing can ever improve my salvation. Your blood cleanses me now. I have your life now. I am saved now. From this moment, I shall strive to follow you and to share the good life with others so that they too can receive your life, O Lord. Thank you, Lord, for my full salvation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Message number 16, A New Creature. Now you are a new creature. Jesus Christ has come into your heart. You now have his new life. You have received the greatest miracle that any person can ever experience. Your sins have been punished at the cross. Jesus suffered in your place. He paid the full price. Your sins can never condemn you again. They're gone, like an old debt that never needs to be paid the second time. From this moment, never do anything else to try to be saved. Jesus did enough when he died on the cross for your sins in your place. Isn't that wonderful? You're not saved because of anything you've done or anything that you ever can do. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 says, By grace, by unmerited favor, are you saved through faith, through trusting what he did. See, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of good works, lest you should boast about it. The way to keep faith. If you ever question your salvation, listen to this message again. Memorize each verse of scripture that we've given to you and treasure them in your heart. The Bible says in Revelations chapter 12, verse 11, they overcame the adversary by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimonies. In other words, when you're tempted by the enemy, remember first that only through the blood of Jesus are you saved. And second, remember that it's the scriptures which told you about your salvation. So you overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb and by the word of your testimony. Memorize some of those verses of scripture and remember them and quote them in your testimony of Jesus Christ. Now that you're recreated, reborn by the life of Jesus Christ, he actually lives in you. So this benediction from Jude, verse 24, certainly applies to you. It says these words, and I pronounce them to you in the name of Jesus. Now unto him that is able to keep you from failing and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Message number 17. Register your decision. Now that you've received Jesus Christ into your heart by faith, a new miracle life has begun in you. Register your act of faith right now. Take a piece of paper and sign your name on it and date it and say, this day I have accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Then send that to me and write me a few words and tell me what Jesus Christ has done in your life. From the very day that I receive your letter, we with our staff 
of believing people will be earnestly praying for God's best to be experienced in your life. More encouragement. I'd like to send you a list of other books we've written and of beautiful cassette albums that we've recorded to encourage and inspire and lift you in life. Remember that the finest way to say thanks to God for His gift of life is to share this happy information with other people. You can become a partner with God and with me in telling neglected people all over the world how to receive miracle healing for their souls, their minds, and their bodies. When you send us your confession of faith, signed and dated, you're opening the way for us to be your personal friends. We'll help you every way we can. We'll reply to you and we'll share with you other uplifting ideas to keep you aware of God's presence with you and of His love with you. We care about you, so let's stay close. We'll keep helping you. So take a piece of paper right now and write on it this day Mr. Osborne, I have accepted Jesus Christ through listening to this audio recording of Miracle Healing. Today I have received Christ. Then sign that and date it and send it to me. And in that way, you actually start more miracles in your new life with Christ because your letter to us opens the way for many more good exchanges between us. We love you. We're with you. We won't quit on you. God won't quit on you because he loves you and love cannot quit. May God bless you. Now, Dr. Osborne will share part five of this audio book dealing with the subject, The Prayer. The author says the fifth step to receive miracle healing is to ask the Lord to heal you according to His promises and to believe that He hears your prayer. Now here's Dr. T.L. Osborne with message number 18. He hears your prayer. To pray with faith does not mean to beg and plead for healing. Remember, if you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior, then you're a child of God and He is your Father. You're not a beggar. The Father wants you to come to Him as any child comes to its parent. Come with confidence. Remember that since He promised to heal you, He wants to heal you. It's His pleasure to see you well, happy, and strong, just as any parent desires the best for their child. In the book of Psalms, David says, Like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear Him. Do you enjoy seeing your children suffer? Neither does your heavenly Father enjoy seeing you suffer. You are invited to come boldly to the throne of grace. That verse of Scripture is in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. And Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you will, ask what you want, and it shall be done unto you. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus invites you to pray. He said, ask, and it shall be given unto you. And listen to this. He said, Jesus said, for everyone that asks, receives. He also promised, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. And God invites you to pray with this promise in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3, Call unto me, and I will answer you. That's God's promise to you. Believe that he hears you. Remember 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12, The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. So when you pray, asking him to do what you know he's promised to do, he hears that prayer prayer. Believe that. No prayer goes unheard when offered by his child with faith. He's interested in you, and it's his pleasure to hear and to answer your petition. John said in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, or according to his promise, or according to his word, or according to the Bible, all of that means the same, you know. He said, if we ask anything according to his will, or his word, or his promise, he hears us. Believe that. Never forget that. So, now that you know his promises, and you know he made them to you personally, now that you've received Christ into your life, 
Ask him to heal your body if you're sick, because he promised to do it. Have confidence, as John said, that when you ask him, he hears you. Remember, he hears you when you ask him according to his promise. Then John continues in verse 15 and says, And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know we have the petitions that we desired of him. I think that promise is remarkable. If you did not know his promises and know that they are for you personally, you would waver when you pray. But knowing that the promises of God are yours, you have perfect confidence that your prayer, asking him to do what he promised to do, is heard and honored by the Father. Message number 19, Ask and Receive. There's no greater blessing in following Christ than to learn to pray and to get an answer. God wants you, as his child, to come to him with absolute confidence that whatever you need or desire, you can ask him for it in simple prayer and faith, and it shall be done to you. He made many marvelous promises, and they are for you personally. Jeremiah 33, verse 3, we've quoted it before. Call unto me. Listen, God is speaking. Listen to him right now, as though you're hearing him speak out of heaven. Call unto me, my child. I will answer you. I will show you great and mighty things which you know not. In other words, he says, just ask me. Let me stretch out my hand and do big things for you. This is God's invitation to prayer and his promise to answer. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. Isn't that simple? Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. This is Christ's encouragement to prayer and his assurance that your prayers will be answered. He said, Everyone that asks receives. This is his promise that everyone in a million who asks shall receive. In his mind, there's no such thing as unanswered prayer. He said, they that seek, find. To them that knock, it shall be opened. It's always God's will to answer prayer. That's his delight when you ask him to do what he promised to do. God invites you to pray, to ask. He's always ready to answer. Why some do not pray. When people do not pray, it's because they have no hope of an answer. Unanswered prayers stand between people and their faith. Some say, I could have faith if I had not prayed so many prayers without receiving the answer. Or they say, I had faith until I prayed so desperately for so-and-so and the answer never came. Many people blame God for unfaithfulness when they should blame themselves for not praying according to his promises. Usually, people don't accuse God of failing to do his part, but they harbor an inner confusion, a bewildered attitude toward prayer, which is developed from repeatedly failing to get an answer. They've inwardly abandoned the hope of receiving what they ask for, so they abandon prayer altogether. That amounts to a surrender of faith, doesn't it? People who do not pray are frustrated in their faith. Their hopes for an answer have been shattered too often. They've given up. Now they continue only in the formalities of their religion. Reality has disappeared. When faith's light has gone out, life becomes a weary road. Abandon your faith, and you must walk your road alone, for God cannot keep company with unbelief. Fear and insecurity dominate the life where faith has been surrendered. You need not lose hope and conclude that prayer is useless. You can pray and receive the answer. The Marvel of Prayer One of the most marvelous communions any person can enjoy with the Lord is to ask and to receive. It's so wonderful indeed that those who have perhaps only received an answer to their prayers once in a lifetime treasure that memory and that experience as long as they live. An old gentleman may dry the tears from his eyes as he relates the one time in his whole life when he cried out to God in a desperate hour and God heard his prayer and answered. 
Yet our Heavenly Father invites us to enjoy this blessing every day of our lives. You can enjoy this blessed privilege today and every day throughout the rest of your life. But you must release those unanswered prayers which are stacked away in the closets of your memory. Forget the past. Maybe you failed then. Never mind. A host of other people did the same. And a host of them surrendered their future with their past failures. But there's another group who, by an act of their own will, wrote those memories off as bad accounts and began life anew. They succeeded. They found happiness and God's abundance too. The Basis for Prayer the foundation for answered prayer is to realize that the only reason you can expect any blessing from God is that Jesus died to provide that blessing. You see, thousands of people pray, but never stop to see if what they ask for is provided by Christ's death. They want healing, for example, because they've suffered so much, or because they've been a good, sincere person or because they've been faithful to church, or some similar reason. Those reasons are no basis for receiving healing from Christ. Now listen closely. The only worthy foundation on which to base your faith for healing is the Scripture. Matthew 8, 17, for example, Jesus himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Another example, Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 and 5. Certainly, Jesus carried our diseases and suffered our pains, and therefore, with his stripes, we are healed. Or in other words, therefore, since he suffered our diseases, we are healed of our diseases because he suffered so that we don't have to suffer. We never have to suffer again what Jesus suffered for us. Now, listen. To get your prayers answered, you must depend entirely on the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ. In other words, what I'm saying is, whatever you pray for, understand that Christ died to provide it for you at the cross. In his death for you, Christ provided every blessing you can desire or require. When you pray, look first to the cross where the price was paid for the blessing that you seek. After all, it's a simple thing to say. If it's paid for, it's yours. If the money's been put on the table for it, you can have it and walk away with it. Understand that since Christ died to provide a blessing, it belongs to you because he died for you, and he wants you to have that blessing because he died to provide for it. He paid for it. It's yours. Claim it, therefore, boldly. You don't have to beg for it or cower and crawl for it. No, stand up like a child of God and claim it and be grateful that Jesus provided it for you in his death. Seven Needs Supplied You see, your needs are sevenfold. Now try to absorb this. It's very important. Seven is the perfect, complete number in Scripture. Now some of what I say is going to sound real theological, but I'll try to make it then as simple as I can so that you can grasp it because it's very important as a foundation for your faith. God reveals himself by seven redemptive names, showing his sevenfold nature which imparts his sevenfold blessings to our lives when we receive Christ. When we receive Christ, we receive everything, everything that God is. Christ's death paid the full price for this sevenfold redemption. You can only need seven different things. Christ's death provided for all of them a sevenfold redemption. Everything we can require or desire is provided at the cross. According to the renowned Schofield Reference Bible, page 7, item 4, under the commentary on Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, the seven redemptive names of Jehovah are outlined. Now, by redemptive names of Jehovah, I mean God reveals himself in the Bible by having announced seven different names for people to call him. They are Hebrew 
pronounced names. I'll give them to you in a moment. They just sound theological and of no importance because they're in Hebrew. But if you'll absorb this, you'll have a foundation for faith. For example, in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6, God is our righteousness. He's called Jehovah Tzidkinu. In Judges chapter 6, verse 23 and 24, God is our peace. He's called Jehovah Shalom. In Psalms 23, verse 1, God is our guide or shepherd. He's called Jehovah Rhea. In Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, God is our physician or healer. He's called Jehovah Rapha. In Genesis 22, verse 8, God is our provider or source. He's called Jehovah Jireh. In Ezekiel chapter 48, verse 35, God is ever present. He's called Jehovah Shammah. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 15, God is our victory. He's called Jehovah Nisi. These seven names reveal God's nature to humankind. Being redemptive names, they reveal the redemptive blessings which he wills for everyone. When we use the word redemptive, we're talking about what Jesus purchased for us in his substitutionary death on the cross. In other words, whatever Jesus did on the cross, dying for us, redeeming us, he did for every human being on earth. A redemptive blessing is a blessing that Jesus died to provide for every person for whom he died. He died for the whole world, for every creature. So a redemptive blessing is purchased by the death of Jesus Christ for every human being on earth. There are no exceptions in redemptive blessings. Redemption is for everyone. This is the most basic fact that you must understand to receive God's full blessings and God's best in your life. There are no exceptions in Christ's redemptive work. What he did on the cross, he did for everyone, every creature, including you. God's redemptive will is proven by Christ's death on the cross. All this means that every blessing provided by the death of Christ on the cross is included in our redemption. And there can be no exceptions, I keep repeating. They are for all, for whosoever will. And I cannot underscore that enough. A redemptive blessing belongs to everybody. God has revealed himself by seven redemptive names. God, through Jesus Christ on the cross, has purchased for us seven redemptive blessings. He has purchased for us righteousness through Christ. Jehovah said, can you? He has purchased for us through Christ peace with God. Jehovah Shalom. He has purchased for us the right to be directed always. Our shepherd, our guide, Jehovah Rhea. He has purchased for us the right to physical healing. Jehovah Shalom. Rafa. He has purchased for us the right to have all of our needs supplied. God is our source, Jehovah Jireh. He has purchased for us through Christ's death on the cross the right to always be with us, near us, because Christ removed our sins and took away the barrier between us and God. So it's Jehovah Shammah. He has purchased for us the right to always stand with us and win through us so that there's no such thing as defeat or collapse. He has purchased the right to be our victor, Jehovah Nisi. Seven redemptive names are in the Bible. The names of God by which he reveals the seven redemptive blessings that Jesus died to provide. 
And when Jesus died to provide seven redemptive blessings, that includes every need or desire that you can have that has to do with a full, happy, successful, prosperous, productive life. My friend, salvation is full and complete. And that's what God is showing you by revealing his seven redemptive names. Why God Answers Prayer The very foundation for receiving the answers to your prayers is to base your faith on the fact that Christ died to provide what you're asking for. You cannot claim healing because you've been good or because you've been faithful to church or because you've suffered so long or because your family needs you well or because you want to work for the Lord. Those are all nice-sounding reasons, but they are not reasons for faith. There is only one basis for claiming help from God. It is the fact that Christ bore your diseases and suffered your pains, and by His suffering, your diseases in your place, your healing was freely provided. Jesus did that for you before you ever knew you would need to be healed. He provided it not because we cried out to him and asked him to provide us healing. He provided us healing before we ever knew we would need healing, which proves to us he reaches out to us. It is his plan, his will, his design that we be well. That's his idea, not ours. So I repeat, there's only one basis for claiming help from God. Christ bore your diseases and suffered your pains, and by his stripes your healing was provided freely. This is a legal basis for your claim. You're God's child. He provided your health by carrying away your diseases. He wants you to be well. Health, therefore, belongs to you. It's paid for, and it's offered freely. You have a legal right to this blessing. It awaits your claim, just like an amount of money deposited to your account at the bank. The fact that Christ died to provide your health makes it unnecessary for you to suffer disease. It makes it unjust and illegal for Satan to inflict disease on your body. He has no right to put on your body what God laid on Jesus Christ for you. Resist the oppressor steadfastly in the faith, as Peter said to do in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9. Claim your health on the basis of Christ bearing your diseases. Refuse to bear the curse of sickness, because Galatians 3.13 says, Christ was made a curse for you and took your sicknesses in your place. See your healing as part of your redemption. Understand that it's deposited to your account. Above all, realize that Christ suffered so that you might have physical healing. Someone always says then, if we are to be healed, how shall we die? Well, the Bible says God takes away their breath, they die and return to the dust. It's easy to live out a full, ripe, beautiful, fulfilled life and then sit down to take a nap or go to bed and quit breathing. Thank the Lord he doesn't have to destroy you with a cancer to help you go to heaven. He takes away your breath, you die, and you return to the dust. That's the way millions of God's wonderful people have gone to heaven, and that's his will for you. If you're old and you're sick, it's not time for you to die. Get well first. Then go to sleep and quit breathing and go to heaven with dignity. Do you believe that? Sickness, you see, is of the devil. It is a curse. It's not natural. It's a killer. It came because of the fall of humankind in the Garden of Eden. It never came from God. Satan brought it. When God redeemed the human race from the fall... The salvation provided by Christ included deliverance from sin and its effects. Sickness is part of the effect of sin in the human race. 
when Christ bore our sins and put them away, he also bore our sicknesses and put them away. He suffered in our stead. He redeemed us. He set us free by bearing the punishment we deserved. We deserve to suffer disease, but Christ carried our diseases and suffered our pains for us. And by his stripes, or since he suffered them, we are healed. Make Christ's death your only argument, the only basis for claiming any blessing. When he paid such a great price to provide the blessings and gifts you need, no other point is worthy of mentioning before him. Tragedy of Unanswered Prayer The greatest tragedy among Christians today is that people do not understand the substitutionary fact of Christ's death. He did not die for himself. He died for you. He didn't carry his own sins away. He had no sins. He was perfect. He was sinless. He put your sins away. He didn't conquer and triumph over Satan for himself. He did it for you. He didn't shed his blood so that he could be near God. You are made nigh to God by the blood of Christ. He didn't empty himself in his death on the cross to supply his own needs. He did it for you so that you could enjoy all that God possesses and never suffer lack. He didn't have disease of his own. He took your diseases away and healed you. The cross is not heaven's triumph over Satan. The cross is your triumph over Satan. Christ's triumph, your victory. God didn't need victory over Satan. You had sinned. You needed redemption. In order for God to deal justly with Satan and provide you a just redemption, he gave his son and required that he suffer all of the punishment that you deserved, all of the consequences Satan intended to put out on his new slave, humankind, Jesus bore. Jesus took all of that on himself, in your name, in your place, for you. Then he arose triumphant in your stead. His victory was for you. You are now redeemed. You are free from sin, and you are the conqueror. You have peace now. You have no lack now. You are healed now. When you approach God in prayer, don't come as a beggar. Come as his child. Come because you've inherited what Jesus died to provide for you. You'll not receive these blessings Christ died to provide if you ignore the cross and his sufferings which paid for them. That's why I impress upon you the foundation for answered prayer is to realize that the only reason you can expect any blessing from God is that Jesus died to provide that blessing. Since it's provided in his death, then it is yours. Claim it. God bless you. Message number 20. Prayer for Healing. Now that you realize where sickness came from, and that it's not the will of your loving Heavenly Father that his children suffer, it's time to approach him in humility and in faith. Remember that he invites you, call unto me, I will answer you. Remember Jesus said, ask, you shall receive and your joy will be full. Remember Jesus said, everyone who asks receives. The reason you can call on the Lord right now and be healed of your physical infirmities and diseases is that Jesus Christ himself suffered all of them in your name, in your place, for you. He did it willingly as your substitute so that you could be healed of them. Jesus took upon himself all the physical consequences of your sinful nature. He is your healer and your savior now. So, right now, pray this prayer right out loud to the Lord and mean it. The prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, say it right out loud. I thank you for your announcement that you are the Lord my healer. I am thankful to know that your plan for my redemption includes physical healing. I never understood that sickness and disease 
resulted from the first sin and rebellion of Adam and Eve. I presume that there was no escape for the threat of physical disease in my life. I knew that in spite of the wonders of medical science, our world is still full of sickness and disease. Now, Lord, I know this is all the outgrowth of sin and evil in the hearts of people. I now understand that our fallen nature is so full of deceit, so full of violence, that it's affected our entire person. Humanity has known nothing but destruction. I marvel that you did not leave us in bondage to Satan. After I had rebelled against you, I deserved to die. Oh, what love you manifested toward me. You sent your son to be the sacrifice for my sins. Why did you love me so much? There was nothing in my nature that merited your favor. Thank you for your infinite love for me. Sin has taken an awful toll in my life, Lord. My physical body was vulnerable. I was subject to disease and sickness. Now I understand that Jesus suffered my punishment. Now I know he took my diseases. Oh, Lord, you suffered my pains. You took my diseases and sufferings. Now I can be completely healed. Your body was tortured. You were beaten beyond recognition. Your back was striped. You were bruised and torn. You suffered my sicknesses so I could be free. Now, Lord, I know that Jesus did this because you loved me. I believe and I accept what you did for me. Dear Lord, I respond to your faith. I accept you in my life. I receive your miracle life in me here and now. I turn away from sickness and disease. I welcome the power of Jesus' life in my body. I am free of sickness. When you suffered my diseases, by your stripes I was healed. I now know that Satan has lost dominion over me. No sin can dominate me. No sickness can dominate me. Oh, Jesus, you are my Lord. Your life is mine. Your health is mine. I am saved and I am healed. Every symptom of my old life is gone. From today, I shall enjoy health because you are my life. You are with me. You are in me now. You live in me. Your life is in me. Thank you for help and for salvation. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now Dr. Osborne will share part six of this audio book which will deal with the subject of the faith. The author says the sixth step to receive miracle healing is to believe when you pray that you have received what you asked for. This step we call faith. Now here's Dr. Osborne with his message number 21, Expect to Receive. Many people pray for years for blessings which God has promised, but then they'll not believe that they've received the answer until they can feel or see the answer. You have to understand this is not faith. Faith means that you're convinced that what God has promised and what you've asked for is yours, that you have received it even before you see or feel it. That faith can only be based on God's promise alone. It's here that your natural mind and your spiritual faith fight their greatest conflict. Here is the battleground of your reason and God's word. Example, you pray for healing, but sometimes the answer is not instantly manifested. You still feel the pain and the fever. God's word declares that by his stripes you were healed. Reason says the disease is still there. 
It's here that you must abandon your reason and believe God's Word. You do not give attention to what you see and feel. You give attention only to what God says in His Word of Promise. God's Promise, the Sure Foundation In Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 to 22, the Bible says, Attend to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. You're here instructed to keep your mind, your ears, your eyes, and your heart occupied with God's promise alone. Now think about this. This gives no time for fear, unbelief, or discouragement. Do this and His Word will produce health in all your flesh. God sends His Word and heals you. God has equipped every person with five natural senses. They're hearing, tasting, smelling, feeling, and seeing. They are natural. And they're given to you to govern you in this natural world. But the Bible says in Romans 12, verse 3, But God has also planted in the heart of every person a measure of faith. Now listen, our five senses are natural, but our faith is supernatural. Now I pray that you'll get this. There's almost nothing in the Bible more important to receiving the blessings that Christ died to provide than to understand what is faith, how faith is different than feeling. It's through our five senses, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, seeing, through those senses that we gain knowledge. But it's not through our senses that we know God. We know God through our faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, We walk by faith, not by sight. Many who pray do not believe that they receive the answer if they can't feel or see the answer. They've not yet learned what faith is. You say, well, if I pray for healing, will I not get healed? Sure. Must I keep on feeling sick and deny my sickness and say I'm healed? No, that's not what I'm talking about. Keep listening. Three attitudes. There are three attitudes with which people regard God's written word, the Bible. Number one, they agree that it's true. Number two, they believe it when they feel it. Number three, they believe it in spite of what they feel, and they act on it. Now let's look at those. Number one, people agree that God's Word is true. They see the Word, they admire it, and they read it. They may memorize whole chapters of it and quote it very holy. They love it and respect it. They say it is true. But they say, not in my case. They say, I don't understand why I can't receive its promised blessings. But I know the word is true. It's a wonderful book. I love it so much. But that's as far as they go. They will not act on what it says if what they see or feel or hear or taste or smell is different than what the Bible says. You see, that's not faith. Number two. People believe God's Word is true when they feel it. You'll hear them say, I never received healing when they prayed for me, but I did receive a great blessing. They could feel the blessing. Or they may say, Oh, I'm sure I'm being healed. I feel so much improved. They're still depending on their feeling. Someone will say, I felt something when I prayed, so I believe God heard me. Or they'll say, Oh, I've prayed so often, but I never feel anything. They'll believe only if they feel or see. This is never faith. Number three, people believe God's word is true, period. They act on the word of promise. These are the people who have genuine faith. You hear them say, if God says it, then it's true. If God's word says by his stripes I'm healed, then I am healed. If God promises to supply all my needs, then He does it. If God says that He's the strength of my life, then He is. And they always act accordingly. You'll hear them say, God is what He says He is. I am what God says I am. I have 
what God says I have. I can do what God says I can do. God will do what his word says he will do. And they act on that basis, utterly depending on the integrity of the word of God. For them, God watches over his word to perform it, as he promised in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 12. And he watches to see that not one word fails. The Witness That Wins Let's look at four different categories of people. Those who have hope, those who just agree, those who feel, and those who have faith. The one who has hope says, I'll have the blessing someday. The one who just agrees with the Bible says, It's wonderful. I should have it, but I can't seem to get it. I don't understand it. The one who goes by what he feels says, When I feel it and when I see it, I'll know I have it. But the one who has faith says, I have it now. It is written. God cannot lie. It is true. I have it. I accept it. I act on it. You see, real faith rests entirely on what the Word of God says. Faith is independent of our natural senses. Faith is the reality of what the senses may register as nothing. There's a continual battle between our senses and our faith. You can read about it in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Walk by faith, not by the senses. Our senses war and revolt against God's word all the time. They argue and fight, saying, It's not so, because I can't see it yet, I can't feel it yet, it's not so. But faith calmly declares, It is written in the Bible. God's word declares it, and it is true, I believe it. To walk by faith means to give God's word the preeminence over what we see or feel. To walk by sight means to give our senses the preeminence over God's word, and we must not do that ever. Faith is God's way. It's contrary to the natural way. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. God's way is for you to keep your mind, your ears, your eyes, and your heart occupied with his word while he brings it to pass, while he materializes it, manifests it in your life. The way of the natural person is to keep your mind on the disease, your ears tuned to those who tell you to be careful, your eyes on the symptoms, and your heart filled with fear and discouragement. But God's order for making his words help to all your flesh is to give all of your attention to his word only, to believe what his word says, to confess it, even when symptoms contradict it. God's very first call to you, if you want to follow him, is to forsake your ways and your thoughts. Romans chapter 4 verse 17 says, God calls those things which be not as though they were. In Luke chapter 18, verse 42, Jesus pronounced the blind man healed while he was still blind, and he received his sight. In Luke chapter 17, verses 12 to 19, Jesus declared that the lepers who came to him were cleansed while the disease was still apparent. But the Bible says, as they went away, they were healed. In John chapter 11, verse 41, at the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus prayed, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. He knew God had heard his prayer for Lazarus to be raised even while Lazarus was still dead. That was faith, and Lazarus came forth and was raised from the dead. Faith means that we believe God has already done what we ask him to do, even before we see it happen. We believe it's done not because we see it done, but because God's word declares it's done. In this way, we also do like God. We call those things which be not as though they were. But you see, before we will do that, we must understand the redemptive blessings of God. 
when we understand that Jesus went to the cross and died in our name, in our place, on our behalf, to provide all seven redemptive blessings for us, when we understand that he paid the price, he laid down his life, he paid for these blessings, then we can come to God, pray for them, ask for these blessings, and know that we're asking according to his will because we're asking for a blessing that we know Jesus died to provide, one of the seven redemptive blessings. And as John said, when we know that he hears us, we know we have the petitions that we desired of him. That is faith. Knowing that Jesus died to provide that blessing, knowing that God is faithful and cannot lie, knowing that God hears your prayer, that he created you to be well and happy, knowing that God wants you to have every redemptive blessing that Jesus died to provide, that gives you the basis for solid faith to come before God and pray and ask him for these blessings, the ones that you need that Jesus died to provide, and that gives you the basis for faith to say, now, praise the Lord, I have prayed, I know Jesus died to provide it, I know God has heard me. I know that God always answers. Now, thank God, I know my prayer is heard and is answered. I now have the answer. You may not feel it yet. You may not see it yet. But knowing these facts gives you the basis to say, I know I have the answer. It is in the making. Though I cannot see it, I call it done as though I can see it done. I call the things which be not as though they were, and in that way I'm cooperating with God's law of faith, and I know that his creative power in the seed of his word of promise is creating in me the blessing that I have claimed, and that, my friend, is faith. May God help you to grasp that. Exactly when to believe. Jesus tells us exactly how to pray and receive the answer. Having promised all that we need, he says in Mark eleven twenty four, whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive it and you shall have it. Notice, when you pray, not after you pray 20 years, not after you get well, but while you are sick or while you are in need, he says, whatever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive it, and you shall have it. You can do that when you understand that Jesus died to provide all of the seven redemptive blessings that you need. Those seven redemptive blessings cover every possible need that you can have. When you know that, then whatsoever you desire, when you pray for it, Believe you receive it, and you shall have it. I believe that this is one of the most important scriptures in the Bible on prayer and faith. Notice again, when you pray, believe that you receive. Not when you feel, when you see, when it's manifested, believe you received it. No, that's not faith. That wouldn't take faith. If you can see it and it's manifested, you don't need faith. But when you pray, if you know Jesus died to provide that blessing, if you believe God is faithful, if you believe God hears your prayer, if you believe God wants you blessed, then when you pray for a blessing that Jesus died to provide, then believe that you receive it when you pray for it, and you shall have it. The Father wants you to know that as his child, you can pray for anything that Jesus, his son, died to provide for you. And if you believe you've received it, and you believe Jesus provided it for you, if you believe he died in your place, he made the provision for you, then the Father says, I make this covenant with you, you can have it. It is yours. Now I call your attention to the order of prayer and faith, because most people have this reversed. They think it should be written this way, whatever you desire, pray for it. And when you see it, or when you feel it, then believe that you've received it. This is the way of the natural person who says, seeing is believing. But God reverses the natural order and says, believing is seeing. 
David said in Psalms 27, verse 13, I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. David believed to see it. He didn't say, I had to see it before I would believe it. And God said of David in Acts chapter 13, verse 22, I have found David a man after my own heart who shall fulfill all my will. And that way, God proved again what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. But in Hebrews 11, verse 2, with faith, we can obtain a good report before him. David believed to see the goodness of God, and God said, he's a man after my own heart, he fulfills all my will. Oh, the joy you bring to the Father when you come to him in prayer, not as a beggar, not crawling, not cowering, but you come to him as a child and say, Father, I'm in need of this. Thank you that Jesus died to provide it. I know in the Bible that he died to provide this blessing. Now I thank you for it. I come to you for it. Let it be manifested in me. I know you hear me. I have this confidence. Thank you, Lord. I accept it. Praise the Lord. And then get up, go your way, and act on the basis of God's word coming to pass in your life. In other words, begin to do what you couldn't do before, or act as though the thing you ask for is already manifested. Act your faith and it will come to pass. Human logic rebels and argues, if I can't feel it, I won't believe it. This is not God's way, and nowhere can this attitude be supported by the Scriptures. Thomas said in John chapter 20, verse 25, Except I shall see, I will not believe. And this attitude did not please Christ. God's way is, believe you receive it when you pray, and you shall have it. His condition is to believe that he answers your prayers when you pray. And then he says, I will make it good in you. When you pray for healing, God authorizes you to consider your prayer answered. This is true when you pray for any other blessing which he's promised and which Christ died to provide. In my book, there's plenty for you. It will help you so much to discover the wealth of God's seven redemptive blessings. It has seven great chapters in that book. There's plenty for you that deal with the seven provisions that Jesus died to provide for you. Learn to put your believing in the right position. People put it after they see and feel the answer. Christ places believing before you see and feel the answer. When God's word is the only reason for believing that your prayer is answered, that, my friend, is faith. When healing begins. God has not promised to begin your healing until after you believe that he's heard your prayer. Since this is true, believe that your prayer is heard when you really pray. 1 John chapter 5, verse 15 says, We know that we have the petition we desired of him, not because we see the answer, but because we believe God is faithful who also will do it. That scripture is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24. Three Witnesses In every healing, there are three witnesses. The Word, the pain, and the sick person. Number one, the Word, which declares, By his stripes you were healed. Number two, the pain, which declares, That sickness is not healed. Number three, the sick person, who declares, By his stripes I am healed. Placing your testimony alongside the Word of God. You refuse to take your testimony back. You declare in the face of pain and symptoms, I am healed because God says so. Then you remember the scripture and you do what it says in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23. You hold fast the profession of your faith without wavering for God is faithful that promised. You maintain your confession of God's word that you're healed and God makes it good. Because he said in Psalms 89 and 34, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that's gone out of my lips. And as God said in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, 
my word shall not return to me void. Revelation 12 verse 11 says, They overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. In other words, they overcame the enemy first on the ground of being saved, a child of God, redeemed through the blood of Christ, and second, by confessing the word of God in their testimony. How to win over Satan When, after you've prayed for healing, Satan tells you that you'll not get well, say to him, It is written, I shall recover. The Lord shall raise me up. The word of the Lord in your confession will defeat your adversary every time. When Satan tempted Christ in the wilderness, we read the story in Matthew chapter 4, verses 4, verse 7, and verse 10, that all the devil heard from Jesus was, It is written, it is written, it is written, and he'd quote a scripture every time. And the third time, the results were, Then the devil left him. Christ's way of resisting and overcoming Satan was by confessing the written word. Since his way is best, let's follow his example and not try another way. Ephesians 4.27 says, Neither give place to the devil. James 4.7 says, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Real Faith Genuine faith in God's Word is more than believing only what you can see or feel. Genuine faith means that you're so convinced of God's promises that you believe them even in the face of contrary evidence. Too many have the wrong idea of the nature of faith. They think it means a vigorous exercise of the mind, that one must strain and worry in order to grasp God's blessings. They say, I have all the faith in the world, but until I see some change, I don't believe I am healed. I refuse to claim something that I don't have. I believe if a person is healed, he or she will know it. That's the wrong idea of the nature of faith, my friend. Faith for healing is exactly the same as faith for salvation. The Bible teaches you that you must believe that you're saved and confess your salvation boldly on the basis of God's promise alone before you feel the joy of forgiveness. The joy will come if you only believe and claim the gift of salvation by faith, but you must believe on the authority of God's word alone that you're saved. This is faith. This is God's way to save lost souls, and this is also God's way to heal sick bodies and to fulfill any of His redemptive promises. The Bible teaches that the sick must believe that they are healed, regardless of how they feel, they must believe that they are healed on the basis of God's promise alone. They claim the blessing of healing by faith, confess it boldly, then the joy of healing will come. They don't doubt If symptoms don't disappear immediately, they stand firm on God's word, and it's always fulfilled. This is just as right for healing of the body as it is for healing of the spirit. In fact, this is God's way of bringing about the fulfillment of any promise he's ever made for us. The Blessing of Knowing To learn how to believe that God hears and answers you when you pray is a much greater blessing than the healing itself. Because you can pray the prayer of faith scores of times for yourself and for others. And your whole life can be spent knowing the unspeakable joy of having God answer your prayers and fulfill His promises for you. John says in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, which I've read before, This is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His word or according to His promise, He hears us, and if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. That is a terrific promise. Knowing that God has promised the blessing you seek, when you ask Him to do it, you know you're asking according to His will, because His promise is His will. Knowing that you're asking for what He's promised to do, you have perfect confidence that He hears that prayer. Knowing that He always hears you when you ask according to His Word, you know you have the answer because you know He will do what He's promised to do. That, my friend, is praying with faith, or as James calls it, the prayer of faith. That's the only way to believe when you pray that you've received what you ask for.
Now Dr. Osborne will share the seventh vital part of this audio book, which deals with the subject of the action. There are three significant messages in this final section. The author says the seventh step to receive miracle healing is to praise the Lord for the answer to your prayer and to act on His promise. Now here's Dr. T.L. Osborne with message number 22, The Proof of Winning Faith. If you believe that God has answered your prayer and that you have received the healing you ask for, you will automatically want to do two things. First, you'll want to thank Him for it. And second, you'll want to use your help by putting it into action. Examples of Faith In Romans chapter 4, verse 20, the Bible says Abraham gave glory to God for the fulfillment of God's promise to him long before the answer was manifested. He praised God because verse 20 says he was strong in faith, and verse 18 says he believed that it would be according to that which was spoken by God. And according to verse 21, he believed that what God had promised he was able to perform. Therefore, Abraham could praise the Lord for the answer even before he could see or feel it. He believed God's word. In the book of Jonah, chapter 2, verse 9, Jonah sacrificed with the voice of thanksgiving for deliverance from the whale's belly even before it vomited him up. Well, another case in Joshua, chapter 6, verses 10 and 16. Joshua and his people shouted praise to the Lord for delivering the city of Jericho into their hands even while the walls were still standing. They believed God's promise. They praised Him for it. They acted their faith. They marched around the city. And as they marched and praised the Lord, the walls fell down flat and the victory was theirs. That's the way God does. Not to praise God for your healing, which He's promised, and for which you've asked Him, would prove that either you don't believe that you've received it, or it would prove that you're not thankful for it. Psalms 150, verse 6, David says, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Hebrews 13, verse 15 says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. Faith proved by action. Not only does genuine faith praise God for the answer, but it's always accompanied by corresponding actions. In James chapter 2, verse 18, he says, I will show you by my actions what my faith is. You see, genuine faith means that you're so convinced that God's promises are good that you praise Him for their fulfillment and act on them even before you see them fulfilled. This puts God to work making them good. You may take all the other six steps of faith to receive healing from Christ that we've presented to you. But if when you pray for healing, you do not believe that God hears you and that you've received the answer, that is, if you do not believe that enough to act on His word of promise, your faith will profit you nothing. Almost the entire second chapter of James deals with this vital secret of faith, acting on God's word. James chapter 2, verse 14. What does it profit, though you say you have faith, and have not works or corresponding actions? Can faith alone save you? James chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, he gives an example. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being alone. James here compares faith to love. He says that love and word only is of no value. Actions of love must accompany those words. Even so, faith in words only is of no value if actions of faith do not accompany those words. God said that I am healed. A lady in New York who had been sent home from a tuberculosis hospital to die was reading the scriptures one afternoon. She was a wonderful Christian, but had not been taught the truth of divine healing. Suddenly she read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. 
who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Then she wept with gratitude because Christ had already taken away her sins. She knew that when her hour came to die, she was ready and was not afraid, because the Bible said that Christ had already taken her sins upon himself. While rejoicing over this scripture, she wiped her tears and continued to read. And this is what she read, and by whose stripes you were healed. She reread the first part of that verse. It stated that Christ had already borne her sins. It was in the past. So she was saved. She knew that. No one could make her doubt that. But what about these last words of the same verse? By whose stripes you were healed. You were healed. Could that be true, just as literally as the part concerning her sins? Yes, she thought, that must be true. That's God's word. Mother, she called, did you know that God said in his word that I was healed? And the mother came rushing and replied and said, Oh dear, what do you mean? The daughter said, Look here, mother, with tears flowing down her cheeks, just listen to this. The Bible says, By whose stripes you were healed. That must mean me. Just look at it, mother. By whose stripes you were healed. Mother, it's already been done. I am healed. Get my clothes, mother. I must get out of this bed. The mother tried to calm her daughter, but to no avail. She insisted, Have you not taught us to believe all the word of God? If this is God's word, then it's true, and I am healed, because God does not lie. She arose. She dressed herself. She began praising the Lord as she walked through the house and was completely healed. In less than three weeks, that lady was normal in weight. X-rays showed that her lungs were perfectly sound. What happened? She had believed God's word enough to act on it. It was her actions which proved that she had faith. She could have lain in bed and died of tuberculosis if she had not acted on the word, arisen by faith, claiming what God's word declared that it was hers. She made it hers by her faith accompanied by her actions. Why many die prematurely? Thousands of good people die prematurely, claiming all the time that they believe the word of God, but their faith is never accompanied by corresponding actions. James said in chapter 2, verse 17, Faith, if it has not corresponding actions, is dead, being alone. They say that they believe God's word is true, but at the same time they act just the opposite. They lie in bed, talking about their faith, but at the same time they're afraid to rise by faith, afraid to act on his word and to claim their healing. Their faith may be great, it may be the greatest faith in the world or all the faith in the world, but it's dead faith, and so it profits them nothing. There's no action. In James chapter 2 verse 18, he said in substance, try to convince me that you have faith when you never act like it. I'll ask you to observe my actions to see my faith. Reverend Byram, a great Bible teacher of the late 1800s, relates the following incident that occurred in his life. Quote, Shortly after the Lord called me to work for him, I learned a very precious lesson about faith. There was much sickness in our community. Three of our family had been stricken down with fever. I felt the disease taking hold of me and was soon overpowered by it. Lying in bed with a burning fever and suffering excruciating pain, I began to commune earnestly with the Lord. I told him that he had called me to the ministry, which in my present condition I was unable to fulfill. As there were no elders who believed in healing to call upon, I began to refer my case to the Lord and to quote his many wonderful promises, among which was, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done to you. So I examined my consecration, and then asked him to search me. I was willing to do anything for him, and I said, Lord... I'm abiding in you, and your words are abiding in me, so this promise is mine. I give my case entirely into your hands. I pray you with all my heart, heal me. Then Reverend Byram continues. He says, Then I waited for the work to be done, but no change came. Finally I said, Lord, why am I not healed? And the answer came back at once. Take me at my word and arise. I said, Amen, Lord, I will. 
and without hesitation, I began to get out of bed. It seemed as if my head would burst with pain, but in my weakness, I began to dress myself. When half-dressed, a slight change came over me, and dropping upon my knees, I thanked the Lord for it. After dressing and giving thanks again, I was much better, and I walked into another room declaring that the Lord had healed me. Within twenty minutes, the fever had entirely left my body. Immediately I went to work and was well from that very hour. I am very sure that had I lain and refused to act boldly on God's word of faith, I would have had to pass through a long siege of sickness caused by that fever. To God be all the glory. It taught me a very valuable lesson in trusting God in his word. I found that when faith is acted upon, in spite of every contradictory evidence, God will always fulfill his word. End of quote of Dr. Byram's story. In James chapter 2 verse 26, he says, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Dr. Byram certainly proved that. Action is what counts. All through the Bible, people of faith were people of action. Those who believed God's words were those who acted on his word. Jesus said to the paralytic in Mark chapter 2 verse 11, Arise, take up your bed, go your way into your house. The man did not reason, but Lord, I am paralyzed. He believed Christ's spoken word enough to act on it. His action proved his faith. The Bible says in verse 12, Immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went forth before them all. Jesus commanded a man with a withered hand in Mark chapter 3 verse 5, Stretch forth your hand. The man did not reason, but Lord, my hand is paralyzed, I can't do that. No, he acted on the word of Jesus, he stretched it forth in an act of faith, and it was immediately restored like as the other. At Peter's house, we read the story in Luke chapter 4, verse 39, of how his mother-in-law was in bed sick of a fever. Luke tells us that Jesus rebuked the fever, and then the gospel of Mark tells us that he took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her. This is a perfect example of faith in action. First, Jesus rebuked the fever. Second, he made her arise and act her faith. And third, the fever left her. In the book of Acts chapter 3, Peter commanded a crippled man, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The man acted on the word of Peter, spoken in Jesus' name, and was immediately healed. In Acts chapter 9, Peter told a man who had been paralyzed for eight years, Aeneas, Jesus Christ makes you whole. Arise and make your bed. And he arose immediately. Acting on God's Word We act on the word of our postman. He tells us that a registered parcel awaits us at the post office. We believe him and go claim the parcel even before we've seen it. We act on the word of the doctor. He tells us to take three pills each day. We believe him and take the pills even before we've felt any results. We act on the word of our banker. He notifies us that a friend has deposited a sum of money to our account. We believe him and begin checking on the money even though we've not seen the money. We act on the word of our heavenly father. He tells us, I am the Lord who heals you. By the stripes of my son Jesus, you were healed. We believe him. We go to him in prayer, claiming his healing. We believe that he hears our prayer. We arise from our beds of sickness and praise him for the answer, even before we feel the results. We act on his word, and God confirms it and makes it good. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 12, God says, I watch over my word to perform it. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56, the Bible says, There has not failed one word of all of God's good promise which he promised. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, All the promises of God in Jesus Christ are yea, and in him, amen, meaning every one of them's good, he'll back up every one of them. Matthew 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away. But my word, Jesus said, shall not pass away. In the days of the Bible, people of faith acted on the spoken word of God. Today we act on the written word of God. In Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 25, God says, 
I am the Lord. I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. I say the word and will perform it, saith the Lord God. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 12, Daniel said, And God has confirmed his words which he spoke. In 1 Peter 1, 25, Peter said, The word of the Lord endures forever. In Romans chapter 4, verse 16, Paul said, The promise is sure to all the seed. And in verse 21, he said, What God has promised, he's able to perform. In Luke chapter 1, verse 37, in the Revised Version, the angel said, No word from God is void of power. Believe God's word today. Act on God's word this hour. This message has brought new light to you. Now walk in that light. It's built your faith. Now put action to that faith. It's acquainted you with God's promises. Now act on those promises. Walk out of prison. Suppose a person bound hand and foot and cast into prison were to make an appeal for a pardon. The jailer comes and presents the paper showing that the request for a pardon has been granted. The normal thing to do is first to be thankful and second to walk out of prison because you're legally free. Suppose the jailer reads the pardon, takes off the fetters, unlocks the prison doors, throws them open and says, you're free, go in peace. But the person says, I know the pardon says I'm free, and I believe every word of it, but I'm still in prison. The doors are open, come out, says the jailer. But they say, I know the doors are open, and I know I'd be free if I was out of here, but I'm not out. Well, the jailer says, come on out, don't you believe the pardon? And the person says, oh yes, I believe every word of it, but it seems as if I'll never get out of this place. A pardon would be of no value to such a person, because they'll not act on it. In like manner, the promises of healing are of no benefit to those who will not act on them. No matter how much you may pray and cry and beg and even fast, if you will not act on God's word, your faith is dead and profits you nothing. No matter how many may pray the prayer of faith for you, your own unbelief renders those prayers ineffective when you fail to act on God's word. Your refusal to act on his word is in reality your refusal to accept the answer. When you do not act on his promise, that indicates that you do not believe that you've received the answer. And God does not promise to begin healing you until you believe that you have received the answer. Your acting on God's promise is actually the proof of your winning faith. I have faith, but... Many who say that they have all the faith in the world prove just the opposite by their action. For example, they'll say, Oh, yes, I have all the faith in the world. I've always believed the Bible. But somehow I just can't get healed. I try and try to believe, but it seems I don't get anywhere. They remain in bed or continue to use their aid. To say that, you ignore the fact that God says, With the stripes of my son Jesus, you are healed. You refuse to believe that you were made whole in Christ when he bore the stripes by which you were healed. You agree that the word is true with your head, but you've never believed it with your heart, and you've never acted on God's word. Faith is always expressed more in actions than in word. In Mark chapter 2, when those four men came carrying that man sick of a palsy and let him down through the roof, Jesus saw their faith. The Bible says, Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the sick of the palsy, Son, your sins be forgiven you. Rise, take up your bed and walk. It doesn't say, and Jesus, hearing them brag about how much faith they had. But it says, and Jesus, seeing their faith, forgave the man and healed the man. He saw their faith in their action. Never talk about or brag about your faith. If you have faith, fine. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But don't talk about it all the time. Just act on it. That is believing. When God speaks, go for it. If God says, I am the Lord that heals you, and who heals all your diseases, then act on that and put God to work making it good. Don't lie in bed, boasting of your faith, yet complaining about your pain. Just rise up 
and take God at his word, acting your faith in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit on the basis of his word, counting on God's covenant, and God will make his word good to you. Your faith becomes stronger as you act on the word. And let the word live in you as it lived in Jesus. You become a doer of the word, like James said in chapter 1, verse 22. A practicer of the word, not a talker about the word. God is no closer to anyone else than he is to you. He will answer no one any quicker than he will answer you. He is your father. The word of promise is yours. Christ the healer is yours. If God says, I am the Lord who heals you, and you believe these words, act on them. Then the bedridden will arise by faith and be made whole. The lame man will leap as a heart. The tongue of the dumb will begin to sing. Deaf ears will hear again. Pains will flee. Darkness will vanish. And you will begin to do the very things you could not do before you took God at his word, acted on that word, and were healed. God will create in your body the very thing that you need in order to be well and strong. Weakness will be transformed into strength. Death will be transformed into life. Sickness will be transformed into health. Impossibilities will become possibilities. She climbed the wall. During one of our campaigns, the crowd packed around the outside wall of the auditorium from 3 o'clock in the afternoon, waiting for the gates to be opened at 6.30 in the evening. One poor woman carried her husband on her back all the way from the country. He had suffered a complete paralytic stroke. Upon reaching the auditorium wall, finding the gates locked, but seeing hundreds of others climbing the walls to gain entrance to the building, she proceeded to shove her husband over the wall, climbed the wall herself, picked him up, and carried him into the building and brought him to me for prayer. She was acting her faith. Needless to say, he walked out, healed by God's power. Faith in action always wins. Never be afraid to believe God and to act upon his word. Remember that Jesus said to the father of the little girl who was reported by the skeptics to be dead, Be not afraid, only believe. That's Mark chapter 5 verse 36. And in Luke chapter 18, verse 27, he said, The things which are humanly impossible are possible with God. Message number 23. Walk out to freedom. We've now given you seven steps to receive miracle healing. Number one, know that the age of miracles has not passed and that physical healing is part of Christ's ministry today. Number two, Know God's promises to heal in the scriptures and be firmly convinced that they are made for you personally. Number three, understand that God wants you to be well. Only Satan wants you to suffer. Number four, understand that divine healing or healing from God is a part of your salvation. Number five, Ask God to heal you according to his promises and believe that he hears your prayer. Number six, believe when you pray that you have received what you prayed for. And number seven, praise the Lord for the answer to your prayer and act on his word of promise. Principal Steps to Success These same steps of faith will bring about the fulfillment of any promise which God has ever made to you. Carefully following these seven steps of faith will cause God to manifest in your life any blessing which Christ died to provide. And don't forget our book, There's Plenty for You, will help you discover God's sevenfold blessing covenant for seven basic needs in your life. We could, in fact, state the way of faith in only three brief steps. Let's brief it even more. Number one, no. Number two, ask. Number three, act. Number one, know what God has promised. Number two, ask him to do what he promised to do. Number three, act like he has done what he promised to do. These are the three principal steps of faith to receive anything God has promised or any blessing Christ died to provide for you. Knowledge of the promise comes first. 
Prayer comes second. Action with praise comes third and last. When you have a clear knowledge of God's promise to you and have asked Him to fulfill it, then He expects you to begin to do by faith the things which you could not do before without His help. Your actions and praise prove the reality of your faith and God confirms His word and fulfills His promise. Act your faith. Act on His word. Begin to do the things which you could not do before you ask Him to heal you. He will confirm what He's promised. Rise above your doubts and fears. Prove your faith by your actions. Claim your liberty from Satan's prison of sickness. The promises of the Bible are God's guarantee of your liberty from sin and sickness. Walk out of that prison of bondage, confessing God's promise as the basis for your freedom. Act on what you know. You've known for a long time that God's word was true, but you've never acted on it. You've had faith, but you've never put that faith into action. You've made your faith a prisoner. It's been lying dormant because you've refused to act on God's word. Now you can go free. Call on the Lord. Confess his promise. Ask him to fulfill it. Believe that he hears you. Claim your healing by faith and begin to do the things that you couldn't do without his help. Your pains will vanish. Your weaknesses will be turned into strength. Light will come to your blind eyes. Sound will enter your deaf ears. Life will flow into your paralyzed limbs. God will make his word good to you. Launch out. One night Christ's disciples labored with their fishing nets, trying to catch a few fish. They were trying to make an honest living, but had caught nothing. In Luke chapter 5, we read the interesting story. Jesus came along and said, Launch out into the deep. Let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said to him, Master, we've toiled all night and have taken nothing. But then he thought, Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Hear it again. Nevertheless, at your word, Lord, I will let down the net. Peter didn't stop to argue the unreasonableness of his master's words. He did not stop to explain how hopeless the case was. He didn't explain that he knew those waters, and he knew there were no fish in that place because he was smart enough to catch them if they were there. Perhaps you've been ill for years. Many prayers have been offered for you. Many doctors have shaken their heads in the despair of fruitless efforts to help you. Maybe they've told you that only a higher power can heal you now. You've tried time and again to receive healing, and you've failed. But my friend, the word still declares, by the stripes and sufferings of Jesus, when he bore your diseases, you were healed. Take new courage. This time say, in spite of all of my problems in the past, nevertheless, at your word, Lord, I will come to you again. At your word, I shall recover. At your word, Lord, I shall be completely healed. God's word cannot fail me. Believe it with all of your heart, and at his word, act your faith. Only believe. In Mark chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus spoke to the father of a lunatic son who was also deaf and dumb. Jesus said, If you can only believe, all things are possible to them that believe. If you, right today, will only believe, you can be healed right now where you are. Rebuke and resist the enemy that's interfered with your health and claim your healing. Pray like this right after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you've made known these truths to me. I thank you that Christ has borne my diseases you have taken my weaknesses in my place. I thank you that I don't have to bear them, Lord. Jesus took them in my place. I'm so glad to know this truth, Lord. Satan is to blame for my sickness. You have not placed them on me, Lord. You want me well and strong so I can glorify you and serve you. I thank you for the knowledge that I have a legal right and authority over all devils. Pray this right after me. Mean it from your heart. Say, now, Father, I come according to your word. I expect you to fulfill your promise made to me. 
You said, I am the Lord who heals you. I ask you in Jesus' name, according to your word, heal my body right now, Lord. I rebuke the enemy that's caused my suffering. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command the life of my sickness to leave and every symptom to be destroyed by the power of God. Father, I thank you that you've heard my prayer. You've granted the answer now. I ask for healing because Jesus died to purchase healing for me. I claim healing now according to your promise. I thank you that the source of my sickness is destroyed. According to Jesus' promise, I shall recover. In Jesus' name I have prayed. I know my request is heard and granted. In Jesus' name, I shall act upon your word. Thank you, Lord, that you've heard my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Believe your prayer is heard. Now that you've prayed and condemned your disease in Jesus' name, be assured that God has heard and answered your petition. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 says, Hold fast the profession of your faith without wavering, for he's faithful that promised. Allow the devil to hear nothing from your lips but the confession of God's word. If Satan suggests that God has not heard and answered you, do like James said in chapter 4, verse 7, Resist the devil steadfast in the faith, and he will flee from you. Treat him like Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 44, He is a liar. God's word is true. God watches over it to perform it for you. Begin doing the things which you couldn't do before. Do them in Jesus' name, claiming the healing which he's provided and for which you've prayed. Every week testimonies come to us from those who have been miraculously healed by our Lord as they've come to understand these truths and have acted on them. I would appreciate a personal letter from you telling me what God has done in your life as a result of these messages that I've recorded for you. What God has done for others, he's doing right now in you through the power of his word that's been planted in you. Message number 24, You Are Transformed. When you discover your roots in God and identify with his purpose for you on this earth, you've begun to really live the life God intended for you to live. It's a lifestyle based on positive faith, positive thinking, positive talking, positive acting. What is the source of this positive faith? Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Here are 52 facts which lift you from boring mediocrity to fruitful partnership with God. They are the stepping stones that lead you from the condemning guilt complexes of living out of harmony and out of contact with God to the success and exhilarating self-esteem which develop when you discover who you are and how you can come to God and share his kind of lifestyle. You discover a new power, a new goal, and a new purpose. You're transformed from defeat to success, from sickness to health, from boredom to enthusiasm, from problems to solutions, from pressure to pleasure, from poverty to prosperity, from hopelessness to happiness. You're blessed, and your loved ones are benefited too. God's full life policy. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. These 52 facts will guide you in a successful, happy Christian life. Then they become the foundation stones of God's full life policy that covers you and your loved ones all of your life. Review them often. Rehearse them in prayer. Recite them in family worship. Recount them to loved ones and to friends. Enumerate them. Memorize them. They'll keep you living the good life as you keep them in your heart and on your lips. Anyone who embarks on this new life with Christ will sooner or later discover a very real enemy. The Bible calls him Satan. 
and mentions him at least a hundred and seventy-five times by such names as Lucifer, the devil, Satan, the adversary, the god of this world, the enemy, the tempter, the wicked one, the ruler of darkness, the murderer, and by other names. You'll meet him in the most subtle form as the accuser. So when you're discouraged or tempted to doubt your experiences with God, rehearse these 52 facts of the Christian life. That is the effective way to resist the devil. And James said, he'll flee from you. Read James chapter 4, verse 7. And never forget that the apostle John said in Revelations 12, 11, which we've already quoted, they overcame Satan by the word of their testimony. And Jesus defeated every temptation of Satan by saying, it is written, then by quoting a scripture. That's why I say that when the accuser tempts you, rehearse these facts and confess these scriptures, and it'll happen to you as it did to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verse 11. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. 52 Facts of Life So learn these facts and make these verses your confession. Fact number one. You were unsaved before you received Christ. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 2, 23. Fact number two. You were guilty before God under the penalty of death. For the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. Fact number three. But God loved you too much to see you perish. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Fact number four. God offered His best to prove His love to you. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. Fact number five. Christ was God's gift and He died for you. But God commends His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, verse 8. Fact number six. You realize that your sins separated you from God. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you. Isaiah 59, verse 2. Fact number seven. Knowing your sins cost God his Son, and Jesus his life and blood. You repent of them. You sorrow to repentance, for godly sorrow works repentance. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 and 10. And you know that except you repent, you shall perish. Luke 13, verse 3. Fact number 8. You confess your sins to him and are cleansed. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, verse 9. Fact number 9. You recognize Jesus at the door of your heart. You open it, and he comes in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and will sup with you and you with me, meaning to dine and have fellowship together. Revelations 3, verse 20. Fact number 10. You receive Jesus and become God's child. As many as receive Jesus Christ, to them he gave power to become the children of God even to them that believe on his name. John 1, verse 12. Fact number 11. You become a new creature. If anyone be in Christ, that one is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Fact number 12. You know you are born again because you receive Christ. Jesus said, you must be born again. John 3, 7. And when you receive Christ with power to become God's child, you were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of a human, but of God. John 1, 13. By the word of God, which lives and abides forever. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Fact number 13. You believe the powerful message of the gospel that saves you. The gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes. 
Romans 1, verse 16. Fact number 14. You believe on the name of Jesus Christ because of the record of the Gospels. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. John 20, verse 31. Fact number 15. You call on his name and are saved. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, verse 13. Fact number 16. You recognize that Jesus is the only way to God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. John 14, verse 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and people, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. Fact number 17. You know there is salvation in none other. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given whereby we must be saved. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Fact number 18. You put your faith in Jesus as Savior. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Fact number 19. You believe that the Lord comes into your life. He says, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 16 and 18. Fact number 20. You do not trust in any good works or self-righteousness to be saved. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. Isaiah 64, verse 6. Your salvation cannot be of works, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, verse 9. Fact number 21. You are saved only by God's mercy. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Titus. Chapter 3, verses 5 to 7. Fact number 22. You know Christ's death justifies you before God. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, verse 1. Fact number 23. You know His blood remits your sins forever. Jesus said, This is my blood, which is shed for many, for the remission of sins, Matthew 26, verse 28. Fact number 24. You know you are cleansed from sin. The Bible says to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, Revelations 1, verse 5, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, Colossians 1, verse 14. Fact number 25. You know your sins are put away and forgotten. Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. John 1, verse 29. He removed our transgressions from us as far as the east is from the west. Psalms 103, verse 12. Our sins and iniquities will he remember no more. Hebrews 10, verse 17. Fact number 26. You know your sins were paid for by Christ's death who his own self bear our own sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. 1 Peter 2, 24. Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Isaiah 53, verse 5. Fact number 27. With your sins punished and washed away, you know they can never condemn you again. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, verse 1. For God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Where remission is, 
There is no more offering for sin, Hebrews 10, verse 18. So now nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ, Romans 8, verse 39. Fact number 28. You know when you accept Christ, you receive His life. Those that have the Son have life, 1 John chapter 5, verse 12. They that hear my word, Jesus said, and believe on him that sent me, have everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but are passed from death unto life. John 5, verse 24. And this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. John 17, verse 3. Fact number 29. You know Satan will accuse you. He is the accuser, which accused them before our God day and night. Revelations 12, verse 10. And that's just like Satan did to Job in chapter 1, verses 6 to 12. Fact number 30. You are not ignorant of his works. Paul said, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, we are not ignorant of his devices. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11. For we know that he comes not but to steal and to kill, and to destroy. John chapter 10, verse 10. Fact number 31. You know how Jesus overcame him. Jesus answered and said to Satan, It is written. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Matthew 4, verse 11. Fact number 32. You know Jesus proved that Satan could not win. Christ was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16. Fact number 33. You know he faithfully helps you in temptation. There is no temptation taken you but such as is common to humankind. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. Fact number 34. You know there are two weapons Satan can never resist. The Bible says, They overcame Satan who accused them before God day and night by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimonies. Revelations 12, verse 11. Fact number 35. You know Satan cannot win over your faith. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walks about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. James 4, verses 7 and 8. And that wicked one touches you not. 1 John 5, verse 18. Fact number 36. You know your faith is the victory. For whoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. 1 John 5, verse 4. Fact number 37. You know not to love the world, but to do God's will. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But those that do the will of God abide forever. 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17. Fact number 38. You know Christ came to defeat your enemy. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, verse 8. Fact number 39. You know Satan is no match for Christ in you. Paul said, Christ is in you, and that's the hope of glory. Colossians 1, verse 27. The Lord said, I will dwell in you and walk in you, says the Lord Almighty. 2 Corinthians 6 verses 16 to 18. You are of God, little children, and have overcome, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. 1 John 4, verse 4. Fact number 40. 
you know your new life source is the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2, verse 20. Fact number 41. You know your new life has divine purpose. The steps of good people are ordered by the Lord, and God delights in their way. Though they fall, they shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds them with his hand. Psalms 37, verses 23 and 34. Fact number 42. You know God sees you and hears you. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. 1 Peter 3, verse 12. Fact number 43. You know he invites you to call upon him. God said, Call unto me, and I will answer you. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Jesus said, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For every one that asks, receives. Luke chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. Fact number 44. You know when you pray that he answers. Jesus said, Whatever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Mark 11, verse 24. And he said, Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. John 14, verse 13. Fact number 45. You know that you belong to God's royal family. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. Fact number 46. You know that all Christ has now belongs to you. This is what the Living Bible says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. And so we should not be like cringing, fearful slaves, but we should behave like God's very own children, adopted into the bosom of his family and calling to him, Father, Father, for his Holy Spirit speaks to us deep in our hearts and tells us that we really are God's children. And since we are his children, we will share his treasures. For all that God gives to his son Jesus is now ours too. Romans 8, verses 14 to 17 in the Living Bible. Fact number 47. You know you have his life in your flesh now. Paul said that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 11. For your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17. Fact number 48. You know you never need to live in want again. Paul said, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, verse 19. For no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Psalms 84, verse 11. Fact number 49. You no longer fear diseases and plagues. David said, There shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come nigh your dwelling. Psalms 91, verse 10. I am the Lord that heals you. Exodus 15, 26. Jesus took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Matthew 8, 17. And with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53, verse 5. Fact number 50. You no longer are oppressed by problems. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, verse 7. Fact number 51. You know you are a winner. Paul said, If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. And nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Romans 8, 37. He which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, verse 16. And faithful is he that calls you who also will do it. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24. Fact number 52. 
you know Christ is with you to the end. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what any person shall do to me. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. And Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Matthew 28, verse 20. Dr. T.L. Osborne would like to hear from you and to know how this audiobook has helped and inspired you. Request a list of all the books and cassette albums. All the address you need is T.L. Osborne, Box 10, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74102, USA. To receive a complete list of the Osborne CDs, books, and videos on DVD, or to request prayer, please write us at Osborne Ministries International, Box 10, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74102, or log on to our website at osborne.org. God bless you.